Diego. Want to know how I ended up speeding for my life in a parched desert with assassins after me? Please, like, subscribe, and keep watching. I wasn't always that daring. In fact, growing up, I didn't like to stay around people, and nothing excited me. Hey, stop that! Easy there. I was just playing with you. Didn't you find it ticklish? I found it annoying. Even the sight of other kids playing wouldn't move me. Why don't you go play with the other kids? They seem like a fun bunch. Why should I? I have all the invisible friends I need. Meet Sam, Ram, and Cam. My parents got so worried about my attitude, they even took me to see a doctor. Nope, it's not autism, but he leans towards being quite unfriendly. Could end up being a very lonely old man. <laughs> Maybe a little exercise would do him some good, or a dance class, something to make him more sociable. My parents became obsessed about trying to engage me and trigger some kind of excitement. They would take me with them wherever they were going, but all their efforts were like water on stone. Until one day, when I was six, they were invited to service some go-karts in a karting arena. The moment the race started, I felt so jittery I could faint. Dad, Mom, I want to ride in one too. You want to join the race? Be with the other kids? Holla, he's never been this excited. This is huge. Mom and Dad were astonished, and of course, just to keep me talking, they rushed me to the sports manager and begged him to make me part of the race somehow. This little girl, it takes months to learn how to drive a cart, years before she can get to race in a competition like this. First off, he's a boy. Please, you don't understand. Our son has never shown interest. Let me handle this. Mr. Man, get my son in there, or I promise you this arena of yours will mysteriously turn into a place of rubbles tomorrow. Mysteriously. Paula Rodriguez? I... Uh, um... I can arrange something. Note about my mom. She was a wrestler before she met my dad. Note end. Thanks to my mom's former <laughs> reputation as a female wrestler, I was put in a cart for the first time, and everything was like magic. I had never felt the burst of energy racing gave me that day, and the experience was enough for me to find my passion. Ten years later, I was ready to be a full-time car racer, but Dad took a stab at my heart with what he presented as his support. Ta-da! Look at this sweet baby. That is... a sweet baby? I spent months secretly working on this car, Diego. It may look rough, but it will do the job. This car wasn't just rough, it was straight up ugly. I could imagine how much I would be laughed at if I was caught in it. I can't. I can't use that to race. Well, it's what we can afford. Take it or leave it. Besides, this car might look throwaway worthy, but you will have a blast on the road with it. Diego, trust me, this car will serve. No, don't worry, it's cool. I will just have to wait until I start earning my own cash, I guess. Save up enough to buy a good car, whenever that'll be. That night, I laid awake thinking of something that could fetch me money in addition to the little I earned helping my parents out. I decided to start washing cars for my parents' clients, but Dad couldn't take seeing me exert myself so much. Diego, so you would pause your dreams to be a racer because you don't have a sleek ride? Uh, that thing in there, Dad, is hideous. No offense. Uh, I guess this is my last resort. Our family heirloom. Yeah. There is this man in Mexico that is popular for collecting precious antiques <laughs> such as this. Perhaps if I sell this to him, he can help us afford a car that is to your taste. It is worth a good number of bucks, you know. My heart practically melted at Dad's gesture. Thanks, Dad. I know how special this heirloom is to you. I will make selling it worth it, I promise. I am trusting you, son. I'll be back in a couple of days. A couple of days turned to weeks, and Dad didn't come back. It was like he had disappeared into thin air. The police kept telling us to be patient, that he could be found, but it was hard to just wait and hope that he was okay. To make things worse, mom turned into a shadow of herself. It got so bad, I began to fear for her. One morning, I woke to the smell of burning food. <coughs> I rushed to the kitchen and saw mom stirring a pot that was turning to charcoal. Mom, what are you doing? What a silly question. Cooking, of course. Cooking or trying to turn the kitchen into an incinerator? Oh, so sorry. <clears throat> now don't you go worrying about me, boy. Of course, I did worry. Seeing Mom so out of it scared me. I couldn't sit and wait for Dad to come home anymore. So after Mom slept, I got ready to go to Mexico and find Dad, or at least know what happened to him. We needed some closure somehow. And for that, I had no choice but to use our oh. only means of mobility, the battered buggy I had rejected. Hey, I know you may hold a grudge against me from last time. Today, I ask for your forgiveness and pray that you please cooperate and not break down on the road. A few hours after I left the U.S. border for Mexico... Stop! 
Are you crazy? I nearly hit you! You're on your way to Mexico, right? Hurry up and drive! Make hay while the sun shines, yo! She really was crazy. I I'm sorry, what? Please, just drive! Help a fellow woman out here! Fellow woman? That's it! Please, get out of my car! I didn't know what her hurry was, but there was no way I was traveling with a crazy woman to Mexico. Oh, sorry. That was an easy mistake, yo. But believe me, if you don't step on that pedal, you and I are gonna... My heart stopped at the sight of a very unfriendly-looking guy speeding towards us. Please drive! They're after me! No way! Their business is with you, not me. Did you rob them or something? Tell me what you did! I am not a thief! They are the ones that want to rob a helpless Mr. Worryberry, yo! Did you say Mr. Worryberry? That's my dad! How do you know him? Where did you see him? No way! Are you Diego? Of all the things your family could have as a special family item? A golden toothpick? Really? You know about our toothpick? That sounded wrong. Who are you? Who are those men? What do they have to do with my father? I'm a Daku. Oh, they're gaining on us. We need to throw them off somehow. I'll explain later, yo. As much as I wanted to stop the car and get my answers, I knew I had to survive first. Find something to throw at them. Not my drink. Yay! He's down. You can slow down now. Oh, no. What now? His colleagues are behind us now. With a car! I nearly gave up when I saw that they were pursuing us with a Saline S7, one of the fastest cars I dreamed of driving. This clunky box has no chance, but I have no choice. It's this or nothing. We're not gonna make it! Quit screaming and start praying! Lord of the skies! Please tell me there's enough space for me in heaven, yo! Not that kind of prayer, you blockhead! <laughs> we're still gonna get you! It's a promise! When we had driven for some hours without any sight of our pursuers, I deemed it safe to rust from all the driving and finally talk to the stranger in my car. But that idea flew out the window the moment Atticu spoke first. Man, that was some awesome driving you did back there. It was like a fast and furious scene. Are you a racer or something? I used to be a kart racer. Haven't really raced with a car before. Well, that's a shame. What's stopping you? Look at what you did with this old car, yo. What was stopping me indeed? I realized then that I had put my career on hold for a stupid reason. I haven't even given this car a chance to prove its worth. And now my dad was missing because I couldn't be content with what we had. Let's focus at the matter at hand. You said you know my father. I ain't so sure he's your father yet, yo. What if you're another of Boss's boys? Is this the worry bear you know? Yes, I was actually on my way to see you and your mom. On your way? From the US? To see me in Mexico? When he told me your name was Diego and your mom Paula, I just assumed you lived in Mexico, yo. Wait, my dad is not in Mexico? Nope, he's in California. My head swam with her words and I rushed out to get some air. Hey, what's wrong? I thought he went to Mexico. You mean I've driven for over 13 hours in the opposite direction? Hey, going back to California is still closer than continuing to Mexico. And you wouldn't have met me, yo. Your dad came to sell this to my boss, Mr. Beeporn. What happened to him? Your dad came down with the flu the same day he arrived at Beeporn's place. Beeporn took the golden toothpick, wouldn't pay. Your dad was too weak to get it back, and Beeporn wouldn't let him go. I was assigned to monitor him, yo, but we became friends, and he begged me to retrieve the toothpick. Correction. Family heirloom? Yeah, family heirloom in the form of a toothpick. My ears seemed to ache from hearing my father's ordeal, but at least there was hope. This B-porn? You will have to take me to him. It's hard to get the police on him. He's slippery like a fish, deep in the mafia. And if he sees me again, he will- Even if he's the devil, no one is going to keep me from my dad now I know he's alive. You took a big risk to help my dad, and I can't be grateful enough, and I won't let anything happen to you. Promise. Okay, that was way too corny. Not my style. Well, don't blame me. It's not like I ever had interest in a girl before, or anybody other than my parents for that matter. Between me and you, I was just winging it. But the heavens were on my side because we found our pursuers in a predicament that proved very advantageous for us. Look what we have here, stuck in the quicksand. I think this is the situation where we say the predator has become the prey. Please help us, please! Oh, I'm willing to help all right, but it's gonna come with a prize. You're going to tell us where to find your boss, give us your phones, and we're gonna need your suits. No way in hell. I heard that there's a music that makes quicksand swallow people faster. Oh, wanna try it out? Sure. Yale, 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 hee-hoo. Told ya. Beautiful medley. I think I wanna hear it again. No, no, please. You fools. How did you let Atakua escape? Who knows where she will go screaming to? Well, 
It's not like she has the evidence to prove it. No one will search the house for a missing nobody. At his reference to whom I guessed should be my dad, I couldn't keep up the disguise anymore. I'm interested in that missing nobody. Imposters! Hello, boss. You traitor. I gave you everything, raised you like my own daughter. Why would you bite the finger that fed you? I can't watch you do the things you do anymore. I can't. Mr. Beefhorn, why would you take my family's heirloom from my dad, refuse to pay him, and still hold him hostage for months? No comment. I knew getting him to cooperate that way would be hard, but I had plan two. Paula Rodriguez! Ready to start talking? Let's go for a ride. Beeporn kept his lips sealed, but by the time we got him to the police station and he saw his boys, he had little choice. With his exposure, the police got to search his house and found my dad. I couldn't have been happier. Dad. Hey, sport. Miss me. I'm so sorry. I was selfish. I shouldn't have let you leave to sell your precious toothpick for my sake. Precious toothpick? That sounds so wrong. Family heirloom. Family heirloom. Sorry. Got bad influence. Hey, old man. You should have just told me your family was right here in Cali, yo. You ran off the moment I mentioned their names. <laughs> Figures. Thank you, Araku. And Diego. I don't regret trying to sell it. Why would I hold on to something that could help my son achieve his dreams? Did you sell it? I don't have to. Yesterday, I realized that I already have what I need. Thanks to that experience, I learned that I didn't even need the fanciest car to be the best racer. My skills were what mattered most. Formula One was a sure goal for me, and I had the best support team. Life couldn't possibly get better. What was that for you? You don't... I thought... we... <laughs> Just messing with you. Come here. I learned that success is not always dependent on having the fanciest or most expensive equipment or resources. If small is what you have, start small. Focus on your skills rather than overreaching or trying to make a big splash at the onset. And hey, drive carefully, yo. Hi everyone, I'm Bella from Portugal. Please like and subscribe to SDA. This hotel has always been my playground since mom worked here as one of the maids. But whenever she caught me watching the guests, she would pull me by the ear. Bella, how many times must I tell you that the guests do not like spies? But mom, what else do you expect me to do while you're cleaning? Why is your daughter here again? I thought I told you this is a place of work and important people. I'm important too, miss. I'm going to be a rich person one day, owning my own designer label. Well, in this place, you are trouble. Please, make other arrangements for your daughter next time. Mom's manager was a big meanie. She was horrible to everyone. And despite her demands, Mom had no choice but to have me at work after school hours. We couldn't afford a nanny or aftercare. I enjoyed being at the hotel, since I loved watching all the fancy rich people that came from all over the world. Call me weird, but I enjoyed stalking the rich people and just watching how they sipped their tea, dressed in their fancy gowns, powdered their faces, and how they enjoy the best of life at the massage spa. I had this dream of being a brand like Gucci or Louis Vuitton. I believed I was a good stylist, but mom kept telling me to focus on my books and to stop dreaming. The only thing you should be doing is learning hard and then working hard. That's the only way money is earned, not by dreams. Then why does Oprah always tell us to dream big, huh? By the time I was 10, I started walking and talking like a rich, classy person, and mom would get so annoyed. Mother darling, could I kindly have a cup of tea? Oh, good grief, not this again. Bella, we are poor and we are never going to be one of them. Mom always knew how to burst my bubble with her <laughs> negative mindset, but I never let that stop me. Once, when I was 15, I sneaked into one of the first class rooms while there was a big event going on at the reception area. When I saw a beautiful yellow gown, just like the princess from Beauty and the Beast, I quickly tried it on since no one was around and was amazed at my reflection. Until this boy appeared behind me. <clears throat> you look beautiful. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, w I was going to put it back. Till we meet again beauty. I was stunned out of my mind, because firstly, the guy was dropped at gorgeous, and secondly, when he touched my face, I felt goosebumps until he disappeared. Like he was some kind of criminal. So mysterious. I ran to the balcony to look for him, and just then, my mom entered. Bella, I've been looking for you everywhere. And where did you get that dress? Relax, mom. I'm going to put it back. Bella, you know I could get into a lot of trouble for this. What were you thinking? I was just imagining myself being rich. There's nothing wrong with having dreams. Well, those imaginations are going to get us into trouble. Now hurry, I hear someone coming. As mom tried getting me out of the dress, the lady who stayed in the room entered, and she did not look happy. 
What on coconuts is going on in my room? And why are you wearing my daughter's dress? I'm so sorry, ma'am. I can explain. How long have you been in my room going through my stuff? I hope you didn't go into my jewelry chest. I felt so bad looking at the fear in mom's eyes, and we would never steal from anyone. But then the woman looked at us more horrified after she searched her drawer. The necklace! It's gone! What did you do with the necklace? We never touched your jewelry chest, ma'am. Please check again. I'm sure you'll find it. Do you have any idea how much that necklace is worth? It's worth more than your pathetic life. It has a diamond worth a billion dollars. I'm calling the guards. After a few seconds, the guards came rushing in, and Mom and I were taken to the police station. I was so confused. And then I remembered that boy. He disappeared like he was a ghost. He could be the thief. <laughs> Mom and I were taken in to be questioned, and the investigating officer kept twisting my words around. So, you went into the room to check if the coast is clear? No, I didn't say that. I usually loiter around the hotel, and I found the door open and entered the room. When I saw a pretty dress, I got fascinated. So, you tried on a dress that was not yours, and I'm sure you even looked for a necklace to go with the dress? No, a boy came into the room and then just disappeared. So, you and your mom had someone steal the necklace for you? No matter how honestly I answered the officer, he still made it seem like mom and I were the criminals. Weeks went by with the police investigating the stolen necklace, and then the final result was mom getting arrested, and I was so devastated. This is all my fault. I'm so sorry, mom. You will have to stay with your uncle for a while. I'm going to get you out of here. I'll find the real thief who stole that necklace. Two years passed, and mom was still behind bars, and I just withdrew myself from everyone. I lived with my uncle, who was a very rich and lonely man. He was actually very nice to me. I don't know why mom distanced herself from him all through my childhood years. Bella, I have opened a savings account for you. This will be for your studies after school, as well as anything else you need as a young lady. Thank you so much, Uncle Todd. I promise I won't ever let you down. You're a good young lady, Bella. Uncle Todd, how come you never married anyone? I got carried away with business, so I kind of forgot about family. But I have you now. I grew fond of my uncle, but even though he gave me everything, I couldn't stop thinking about my poor mom in a cold jail cell. And then something happened one day, while I took a walk in the huge garden. I saw my uncle giving a boy a thick roll of cash. When I stepped closer, my jaw dropped. You! I remember you! Uh, sorry. I don't recall you. Oh, please! You're the thief who stole the necklace from the hotel two years ago, and now my mom is in prison because of you! Is she on some kind of medication? Bella, darling, I think you got the wrong guy. Zane here is my driver, and he also runs a few errands for me. Well, he's also a thief. I was so mad at my <laughs> uncle for not believing me. And the next day, when I waited for the driver to take me to school, I was even more frantic when the driver was Zane. What happened to the other driver? He was sick, so your uncle called me. Shall we leave? Yes, you can stop by the police station. I need to report you. Listen, Bella, I know you saw me that night, but I did not steal that necklace. I was there on another mission. Please, save it. You disappeared like a criminal, and now I want you behind bars. Drive me to the police station now. Zane surprised me when he actually listened to me and parked outside the police station. Shall we go in? Yes, but why did you take that necklace? I didn't take the necklace. That night when I saw you in that room, I was there to find out about a client your uncle does business with. He sent me as a spy to find out if the client was trustworthy. But if you didn't take the necklace, then who did? My mom is in prison for no reason. I became really emotional thinking about my mom and decided to walk to school. Bella, wait! You can leave. I'll tell my uncle you dropped me off at school. No, please, let me help you. The only way anyone can help me is if they find the real thief and my mom gets set free. I know, and I think I know who that thief is. Instead of going to school, I asked Zane if we could sit down somewhere, and he'd tell me everything he knows, so we went to a small coffee shop. How come you're not in school? I study online, and I work for your uncle since my dad, who is my only parent, is too ill to work. Oh, I'm sorry. I also come from a struggle. My mom worked really hard to support me. I used to have this crazy fantasy of being a rich lady in fancy clothes. I don't think that's a fantasy. I think that's a great goal to have. I want to have my own accounting firm one day, like your uncle. You work really hard. I believe you'll make it. That night, before I saw you in that room, another taller woman in a suit stepped out of the room. She had a manager badge tagged on her coat. Oh my gosh, it was the hotel manager. I always knew she was a devious witch. How can I get proof it was her? 
The corridor's camera should have picked up something. Unless she tampered with it. There's a gala happening there tonight. We could go and pretend like we are one of the guests. Are you up for that? I've been waiting my whole life to be one of those rich guests. I used the card my uncle gave me for the first time and bought a glamorous dress for the event. And it was the perfect fit. When Zane picked me up, he was speechless. And so was I, because he looked absolutely dripping hot in his suit. Wow, you went all out. You look very nice. Thank you. You look nice too. Once Zane and I arrived at the hotel, I felt like I was actually living my childhood dream, walking in like an elegant lady with my head held high. Okay, so I need you to distract the manager while I find a way into the hotel camera rooms. Are you sure you can do this? I was born to do this. Oh my gosh, my dress! My half a million dress! It's ruined! I'm so sorry, dear. Is there anything I can do? <laughs> the diamonds on my dress are perishing away! Oh, what a disaster! Please, uh, tell me what I can do! I need… I need a dry cleaner! Go fetch me a dry cleaner! Okay, wait right here. We need to solve this now. After my performance, Zane and I managed to sneak past security and get through to the office section of the hotel. The manager's office is around the corner. Do you think we'll find something in there? I think we should try speaking to the security in the camera rooms. That would get us into trouble. Yeah, but I have a plan. Wait here. Zane took quite some time getting inside the bathroom, and I started getting nervous. As I paced up and down, a security guard appeared and touched my shoulder, and I freaked out. <gasps> oh, oh, hi. <laughs> you should have seen your face. Uh, Zane, you almost gave me a heart attack. How did you get the uniform? I bargained with the real security guard. Now come, we don't have much time. Zane entered the camera room, and I followed behind him. The security guard woke up from his nap. Huh? Uh, do you work here? Yes, I'm the new guy. The manager sent me with this very important guest. She needs some information. Zane was such a sleek talker. The security guard believed him, and I asked if they had videos dated two years back, the exact date when the necklace was stolen. Follow me. I'll take you to the file room, where all the old videos are kept. I couldn't believe that we actually convinced this security guard. After he left us in the room, Zane and I wasted no time. Okay, you look at that shelf and I'll look here. Time was going by so fast as we searched and searched for a tape of that night. I almost gave up, until Zane said, Bingo! I think I got it. Oh, I hope it's the one. I think we should forward a bit. Yeah, yeah, stop! I couldn't believe what I saw. The ex-wicked hotel manager was so brave that she didn't even care about the cameras. How did she get away with this? I hear voices outside the door. Zane, how exactly did you bargain with that security guard in the bathroom? I kinda knocked him out. I'm sure he's up now. That means we need to run. Like, now! Zane and I ran like two leopards on fire. There was no way anyone could catch us. I asked Zane to drive me to the police station, found the detective who was in charge of the case, and showed him the video. Mom was finally set free! Thank you so much, Bella, for not giving up on me. Ever since you were locked away, I blamed myself. If only I didn't go into that room. It's all over now. I hope they find that wicked hotel manager. Me too. This calls for a celebration. We should throw a party. No, oh, we don't need all that. Bella and I will be leaving soon. We are? Yes. I'm back now and I can take care of you. Mom made no sense at all. My uncle, who was her brother, was stinking rich, and she always pushed him away or never spoke about him until she went to prison. Mom, I really like it here. Uncle Todd has been really kind to me. I know, just wait until you make a mistake. He won't be so kind after that. That's all in the past. I'm sorry for not helping you when you needed me. Mom ignored Uncle Todd and walked away. I had to speak some sense into her. Mom, we are not going anywhere. I have a better future here with Uncle Todd. Please don't take that away. I was pregnant with you, and your father just ran away. When I came to my brother, he judged me and told me I was a disgrace. But he regrets it now. Please forgive him. Mom eventually got over her pride and gave Uncle Todd a second chance. And he threw us the biggest party. Hey, why aren't you out there dancing? I've always liked watching people. Strange. Could I dance with you? Maybe we should take a walk. It was a beautiful night, and walking next to Zane made me feel so many things. He was so handsome, but I wasn't sure if he felt the same way. So, do you have a girlfriend? <laughs> no, I've always focused on working hard, so never really had the time. And do you have a boyfriend? 
No, I was so focused on getting my mom out of jail that I almost forgot about myself. Then Zane stopped and turned to look at me, and his eyes just made me want to melt in his arms. Then I think it's time you start focusing on you. <laughs> I'm speechless right now, but yes, I think it's time to work on our futures. Zane and I started dating, and when I completed high school, I had the best family support and boyfriend support to finally be a name brand. I became a successful fashionista, but despite all the money I made, there was only one thing that made me truly happy. Love. Hi, Mom! As I leaned over to kiss Mom, you wouldn't believe what happened. The cover of my milkshake fell off, and the milkshake splattered on the white dress. Suddenly, a blood-curdling screech filled the room. Oh, what did you do to my dress? I paid $5,000 for this dress. You better hope this stain comes out, doofus. Don't you dare talk to my mother that way, you spoiled brat! I'll talk to your mother however I choose. With my fists clenched, I stepped towards Debbie. What is going on here? They ruined my dress for tonight. Daddy, fire her! Mr. Langston looked at the dress that Mom held in her hand, then at the milkshake in mine. Mr. Langston, I can ex- Mrs. Pierce, I think it's time you left. Mom nodded, and without another word, she exited the room, and I followed closely on her heels. Hi, my name is Kylie, and I'm from Costa Rica. Please like and subscribe to our amazing channel. I grew up with a single mom who worked as a maid at the Langston Mansion for over 10 years. Now, thanks to me, mom was fired. I apologized to mom a million times, and each time she said it wasn't my fault, but I knew she was just saying that so I wouldn't feel bad. Mom now worked multiple jobs, which meant she was hardly ever home. I insisted that I'd get a job to help her pay the bills, but mom wasn't having it. Kylie, we spoke about this already. I want you to focus on school. Let me worry about the bills. I decided I would study my butt off to make my mom proud. A few months later, I was super excited when I got a scholarship to college. I can't believe we got into the same college. My best friend Heidi squealed into the phone. Heidi and I met on the playground in kindergarten and we've been friends ever since. College will be amazing. We can change our boring high school personalities and spice things up a bit. Now is the time for a change. New school, new me. The night before college, I was so excited that I barely slept. On the first day, as soon as Heidi and I stepped onto the campus, I got a shocker. <laughs> Surrounded by a group of girls, stood Debbie, soaking up the attention. I groaned. Over 60 colleges to attend, and you and Debbie choose the same one? This can't be happening! As Heidi and I walked past, Debbie shouted, Hey, Nate's daughter, I didn't expect to see you at college. I thought you'd be with your mom, carrying on the family business, being a peasant. I'm surprised to see you here too, Debbie. We all know you didn't get the grade to attend this college, and Daddy paid extra for you to get in. I smirked as I walked past, and Heidi <laughs> couldn't control her laughter, which got her a cold stare from Debbie. The first few days of college were okay. Every time Debbie saw me, she made a snide remark, but I retorted to keep things even between us. However, after the first week, something happened that unhinged my very soul. As Heidi and I sat in the cafeteria devouring our lunch, someone walked into the cafeteria and I cringed. Is that mom? She wore a janitor's uniform and pushed a bucket and mop in front of her. This couldn't be happening. How was I going to be a new person with mom hanging around the school in a janitor's uniform? College was supposed to be a fresh start for me. Maid's daughter, is it bring your mother to work day? Debbie pushed her lunch tray off the table, then placed her hand over her mouth. Oopsies. Anger boiled in me as I watched mom clean up Debbie's mess while her friends <laughs> laughed. I walked over to Debbie and grabbed a fistful of her clothing in my hand. Kylie, let her go now. But mom, she... Kylie. I let go of Debbie's clothing and I walked away and didn't look back. I vowed that one day I'd make Debbie pay. Who did she think she was? I decided to go to the campus library to get some studying done. 
At least that was one place I knew Debbie didn't plan on visiting. Hi. I looked up, and my eyes fell on the cutest guy I'd ever seen. I saw what happened back there. Uh, Debbie sucks. Thanks. Debbie can be so cruel sometimes, it's infuriating. Are you a freshman? No, I'm a junior. My name's Justin. Nice to meet you, Justin. I'm Kylie. Over the next 30 minutes, I sat there glossy-eyed, soaking in every word that Justin said. We loved the same movies, and we both have an obsession with fine art. Hey, maybe I can take you to the art gallery sometime? I'd love that. But until then, I'd love it if you came to my birthday party this weekend. I'll send a car over for you. Can I bring my best friend, Heidi? Sure. The more the merrier. I've got a class, so I gotta run. Later. I smiled and waved at Justin as he walked away. I couldn't believe that Heidi and I just got invited to our first college party! Mm -hmm. On the night of the party, Heidi got dressed at my house. The doorbell rang and I answered it. Good evening, madam. I'm here to pick up Miss Kylie and Miss Heidi. A personal driver? Justin must be rich! Heidi and I waved at mom as we exited the house. About 30 minutes later, the chauffeur spoke up. We have arrived. We were escorted to the back of the house where there was a pool and the party was in full swing. I scanned the crowd, spotted Justin, and gave him a little wave. My heart fluttered as he waved back and walked over. Hey, ladies. Kylie, I'm glad you can make it. Do you want to dance? Before I could accept, Debbie interrupted us. We hired the cleanup crew for after the party, not during janitor's daughter. Give it a rest, Debbie. My dearest brother, mingling with the help is not a good look for us. Brother? He didn't tell you. He didn't tell her because like everything else, you are irrelevant. And with that fire comeback, Heidi pushed Debbie into the pool. And the party fell silent for a few seconds. Justin was the first one to break the silence when he burst into laughter, which was immediately followed by that of his friends. Debbie got out of the pool and glared at us. Angrily, she pushed her way through the crowd and into the house. When she was out of sight, Justin offered his hand. Let's dance. Over the next two weeks, Justin and I got to know each other a lot better. One day during lunch, Justin asked me out on a date and I accepted. I couldn't believe it! Justin wanted to go out on a date with me! On the night of the date, we went to dinner, then to an art gallery before we took a stroll hand in hand under the moonlight by the beach. By the time he walked me to my door, it was close to midnight. I had a really great time tonight. So did I. Our eyes met and Justin leaned closer to me. I closed my eyes and leaned forward nervously, anticipating his lips on mine. But the kiss never came. Not on my lips, anyway. Justin kissed me on the cheek. I'll see you tomorrow at school, okay? Too stunned to speak. I nodded and entered the house. I went straight to my room and called Heidi and told her about my date. Maybe he didn't want to take it too fast. I guess. I'm sure you'll get to the kiss you're longing for in no time. I hope so, because I really like him. Heidi and I chatted for over an hour before we said goodnight. I slipped into a peaceful sleep, totally unprepared for what the next day was about to bring. The next morning, I was excited to get to school to see Justin. I was about to turn the corner in the hallway when I heard Debbie and Justin speaking. What I heard made my heart bleed. Look, I played your silly game. Now pay me the money that you owe. <laughs> I can't believe you actually got her to go on a date with you. The girl was so desperate that she'd go on a date with anyone in her tacky thrift shop dress. Ugh, that date was the worst date I've ever had. I stepped out from behind the wall. So playing with someone's feelings is a joke to you? I slapped Justin across the face and Debbie gasped. You jerk! And you! Stay away from me! I stormed off and went to the girls' bathroom and had myself a good cry. That was the worst day of my life! But then, something happened that night that turned my mood around. I was completing some assignments when Mom burst into my room. Kylie! I won the lottery! What?! I won ten million dollars! The next few days felt surreal. Mom resigned from work and decided to open her own company. Heidi and I went on a shopping spree, and Mom and I moved into a new neighborhood. 
She even bought me a new car! But even though I had money to buy anything I wanted, I actually still enjoyed going to thrift shops. One particular visit gave me the advantage that I was looking for over Debbie. Mom? I watched as Mrs. Langston searched through the clothes on the rack and held a few dresses against Debbie. My friends are getting suspicious I can't keep getting these cheap clothes and trying to pass them off as designer wear. Well, honey, your dad filed for bankruptcy and until we get back on our feet, these stores will be your new best friend. Mrs. Langston walked away and Debbie stomped her feet frustratedly. I walked around the clothing rack and Debbie's eyes widened like a frightened deer. She looked utterly mortified. I'll see you on Monday. As I approached my locker early Monday morning, Debbie was waiting and she looked extremely nervous. Look, about what you saw on Saturday. Honestly, I'm surprised. You always strut around like some kind of princess, as if you're above <laughs> us all. I wonder what everyone will say when I tell them you're broke. Please, you can't. <laughs> I can and I will! Don't, I'll do anything. Good, I'm glad you said that. I dropped my books into Debbie's arms. From now on, you do every single thing I tell you. Got it? Over the next few days, I made Debbie my personal maid. She washed my car, did my laundry, and ironed all of my clothes. And did my chores at home, including cleaning my room. A few days later, as I was looking through some cute rings at the kiosk, Debbie groaned as she struggled to hold my shopping bags. Uh, are we done yet? You're done when I say we are. Or do you want me to tell everyone at school that you're broke? I heard a gasp from behind us and I spun around. There stood Debbie's friends, their mouths open in shock. You're broke? Debbie stepped toward them, but they turned up their noses at her and walked in the other direction. Debbie dropped my bags and ran away crying. Once I gathered my bags, I went in search of Debbie. I found her outside by the car park. Debbie, I'm sorry. Sorry? You found a chance to humiliate me and took it. Me? Maybe if you weren't such a witch when you had money, people may have treated you better when you lost it. And maybe if you didn't have any, you wouldn't be the witch that you are now. Debbie got up and walked away. As I sat there and contemplated her words, I felt terrible. I had turned into someone I no longer recognized. I was totally disappointed with myself. The following week, neither Justin nor Debbie was at school. And talk about them losing their money was the main gossip of the whole class. That afternoon, after giving it a lot of thought, I went to mom for help. I told her everything. Mom sighed heavily. What you did to Debbie was wrong, but I'm glad that you realized that. And you're willing to help? I'll give Mr. Langston a call. Not only did mom give Mr. Langston a call, but she invited the entire family over for dinner. Talk about awkward. Justin didn't look at me once during the dinner, and Debbie just sat there pushing her food around the plate. Mom told Mr. Langston that she had a position for him at her company, and he graciously accepted it. Thank you so much. You don't know how much this means to me. You didn't have to do this, especially after I fired you. I believe in helping people wherever I can. I'm just happy I'm able to help you and your family. After dinner, Debbie excused herself to go outside for some fresh air, and I followed her. Debbie, I'm sorry about what I did. I should have never treated you that way. Can you forgive me? Debbie did something I never thought she'd do. She hugged me! I was taken aback for a few seconds, but I returned her hug. I'm also sorry for how I treated you. I've always been jealous of the love that you and your mom share. I've never had that. With dad always away working and mom always trying to keep up appearances and with Justin being, well, Justin, nobody ever loved me for who I was, only for what I had. Well, now that you have nothing, I hope that you can get the friends that you need. <laughs> I hope so. Maybe we can hang out sometime? I'd like that. As I pulled up to Moe's on Charlotte Boulevard, I still wasn't sure why my older sister Catherine wanted me to install microcams in my glasses. So far, my sister's notes had been correct. This, however, was just weird. I walked into the bar, ordered a drink, and sat in the corner waiting. 
After about 30 minutes, I decided it was time to leave. I stood up and walked to the door, but I stopped in my tracks when the manager made an announcement that changed my life. Hi, my name is Carson. Like and subscribe to our channel. Hit that notification bell so you will know when new stories are uploaded. Now, let's get back to my story. Catherine and I have always been close. Being the younger sibling, my sister was a role model to me, so it was no surprise that I wanted to go to the same college she did. After she graduated and I received my acceptance letter to the university, our parents were ecstatic. My sister was moving away to start an internship at her dream job, and as dad packed her car, she knocked on my bedroom door. Hey Carson, can I come in? That depends. I raised my eyebrows. Do you have any snacks? Catherine tossed me a candy bar, walked into my room, and sat on my bed. In her hand was a pile of pages, held together by ribbon. So how can I help you? I bit into the candy bar. I just wanted to give you my college notes. These notes really helped me, so I'm passing them on to you. She handed me the notes and I inspected them suspiciously. So you couldn't use a notebook? I chuckled. Catherine laughed. <laughs> you know I'm not a neat freak like you are. Just trust me on this. These notes will help you. Have I ever steered you wrong? Well, I scratched my head. Catherine threw a <laughs> pillow at my head and laughed. I'll miss you, Carson. Promise to message me every day, okay? I nodded. Catherine and I shared a hug before Dad yelled up the stairs that if she didn't leave now, she would miss the plane. Catherine ruffled my hair, kissed my forehead, and left my room. Before I attended college, I sifted through Catherine's notes. It was quite ingenious. Catherine created cheat sheets for each professor on campus. Their likes, dislikes, allergies, hobbies, addresses. I should have thought about this in high school, I thought to myself as I read the notes. Once at college, I shared a room with a guy named Adam. We liked a lot of the same things and we got along pretty well. As I moved through the semester, guided by Catherine's notes, I was able to build strong relationships with my professors and of course keep a 3.8 grade point average. During my second year in college, I decided to try and get through on my own merit instead of using Catherine's guide. This, however, turned out to be a grave mistake since two of my professors resorted to giving me D's on my last two assignments. I walked into my dorm room and slammed my bag on the desk. Let me guess. Adam looked up from his phone. You got another D from Professor Damon, didn't you? I thought I had that in the bag. I can't afford to get any more Ds if I want to maintain my grade point average. I tried everything to get those two professors to like me, but it was all in vain. Adam shook his head. Your problem is you've been trying to get the wrong people to like you. Professor Damon and Professor Jackson don't correct their papers, they're teaching assistants do. So they're the ones you should be targeting to get your grades up. That night, while Adam was asleep, I pulled out Catherine's notes. Her notes warned that Professor Damon's teaching assistant, Miss Foster, and Professor Jackson's teaching assistant, Miss Phillips, were not easily swayed and were tough markers. The instructions to handle these two teaching assistants was to head to Charlotte Boulevard, wear glasses, and place microcams on it. That's where you met me at the story, about to leave the bar when the manager made an announcement. Now is the time you've all been waiting for. Let's welcome Candy and Jasmine. The patrons at the bar hooted and screamed as Miss Foster and Miss Jackson walked out from the back in extremely short crop tops and shorts. If I didn't know they were teaching assistants at the college, I would never have guessed it. Without the tight buns and suits, they were gorgeous. I watched in amusement as Candy and Jasmine entertained the patrons by doing tricks while pouring drinks and getting the patrons involved. After about 30 minutes, when I thought I gathered enough leverage and footage for blackmail to get myself an A, I left. I know what you're thinking, that I'm a horrible person for even thinking about doing this. But trust me, in life sometimes, you need to embrace the opportunities as they come. The following week, I had assignments for both professors. After I handed the assignments in during class, I was able to corner both Miss Foster and Miss Jackson in the parking lot. Hi, good afternoon, ladies. I nodded at the both of them. Good afternoon, Mr. Bell. Can we help you with something? Miss Foster looked me over. I just wanted to let you know that I expect A's on both my papers this time. You'll get straight A's if you put in the work. Miss Jackson sounded amused. They began to walk away and I blocked their path. No, you see, I have put in the work. But yet still, I can't seem to hit that A. You are Catherine Bell's brother, correct? Miss Foster asked. That I am. Well, you deserve your Ds. Miss Jackson responded. She turned to Miss Foster. Let's go. As they walked away, I called after them. Last Saturday, I went to Moe's on Charlotte Boulevard. Do you know the place? 
They stopped and I smiled. They slowly turned around. I knew you would see it my way. I pulled my phone out of my pocket and approached them. I played a part of the video before looking at them. You both know what will happen if I don't see grades B plus and above on my remaining assignments. They both nodded. Now that we have an understanding, have a beautiful afternoon, ladies. My life was perfect. My parents were proud that I was doing so well at college. I told them that Catherine helped me every step of the way. That Christmas, my parents bought me a new car. They reminded me to keep pushing forward and that hard work will always pay off. In the new year, in an attempt to preserve the tattered pages of Catherine's notes, I decided to get them bound into a book. There was a bookstore about two blocks from campus, so I decided to head there. Hello, I called as I entered the empty store. An elderly man came from the back room. Hi, what can I do for you? Hi, I have these notes from school that I'd like to bind. I handed him the notes. Okay, sure. Which school do you attend? After answering his question, I asked how long it would take to get it done. The young man who helps me in the store stepped away for a few minutes. He'll be back shortly. The gentleman looked through the notes. I actually have a few errands. Can I come back in a few hours? Sure, no problem. It'll be ready by then. I thanked the man and left the store. After completing my errands, I returned to the store. This time, the elderly man was behind the counter. Hi, were you able to bind my notes? Sorry, kid. The young man had a family emergency and needed to leave. That's okay. I'll just take my notes back and I'll come back another day. Sure. Let me get them for you. The man disappeared to the back. He returned a few minutes later with a solemn face. Uh, I can't seem to find them. My face turned pale. What do you mean you can't find them? You lost my notes? There must be a logical reason. Well, obviously notes don't just grow legs and walk away. I rubbed my temples in frustration. I should have never brought the notes in. Now I lost them. Catherine would be furious. Let me call him and see if he placed it somewhere else. I nodded in agreement. I watched as the man called, but he didn't say anything. Sorry, he's not answering. It's going straight to voicemail. I'm so sorry, this never happened before. The man thought for a bit. I think you both go to the same college. He rubbed his chin. Something clicked in my mind. If he went to the same college as I did, then he probably stole my notes when he realized what they were. Can I have the person's name? Maybe I'll see him on campus. His name is Mateo Robinson. I groaned inwardly. Oh. Mateo and I crossed a few paths in our first year. I didn't like the guy. He was rude and obnoxious to everyone he met. How was I supposed to get my notes back from him? I thanked the man and exited the store. As soon as I entered the dorm room, I fell onto my bed face first. What's your problem? Adam asked. I rolled over and proceeded to tell Adam everything. He sat and listened silently until I was finished. So you mean to say you've had cheat sheets this entire time? Adam raised a brow. Bro, you're the smartest guy I know. You have a 4.0 average. You didn't need any cheat sheets. Adam stroked his chin. While that may be true, you could have still told me. Am I not your friend? Adam asked dramatically. I laughed. <laughs> I need to come up with a plan to get back my notes from Mateo. Adam and I decided that Mateo probably had the notes at home since he didn't live on campus. We recruited Zoe, Adam's twin sister, into the plan. She said she would do it for a fee, but she didn't want to know anything else, just in case we were planning something illegal. An agreement was made and everything was set. Zoe's part of the plan was to get Mateo to ask her on a date. Once the date was confirmed, she had to let Adam and I know so we could search his apartment. After about three days, Adam got the confirmation call. Adam and I drove to Mateo's house, and as soon as Zoe told us they were together, Adam picked the lock and we began our search. This is useless, I whispered fiercely as I searched through the contents of Mateo's wardrobe. Fifteen minutes had already gone, and I didn't want to stay there much longer. I found something. Adam handed me a piece of paper from Mateo's desk. This is a resignation letter, I read confused. Check the date. Adam pointed to the paper. This doesn't make any sense. If he resigned, then... Then it means the old man lied to you, and he had the notes all along. Early next morning, I confronted the elderly man. You lied to me. The man <laughs> laughed. I want my notes back now. I took a look at your notes. It appeared you had a nice thing going there. Yet still, you kept it to yourself. Just give me my notes. I'm not giving you anything. The man glared. And if you have a problem, you can call the police. I'm sure you've blackmailed at least one teacher from these notes already. My face turned red. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a store to run. I walked out of the store feeling defeated. 
Monday morning, I saw a couple of students reading something, but I didn't pay much attention to it till Adam handed me a copy. What's this? I looked at Adam confused. Read it, he said impatiently. As I read through the document, I felt my chest tighten and my head become light. It was my sister's notes. The old man took my notes, copied it, and sold it to the students at the college. Catherine is going to kill me. With great power comes great responsibility, bro. I called Catherine and told her what happened. She explained that now that everyone has the cheat sheet, if overused, it could lead to investigations and her name being called. I promised her that I would keep things under control and she had nothing to worry about. Over the next few weeks, in my free time, I took notes of the elderly man's movements. His name was Fred Miller. He had a wife, May, and he had been married to her for over 30 years. However, Mr. Miller enjoyed certain extracurricular activities that I was positive his wife wouldn't have approved of. Good afternoon, Mr. Miller. I walked into the store and greeted him. He looked across at me a bit shocked as he continued to deal with his customer. Will May be going to her book club tonight? I think she needs to stay off her foot for a bit longer, don't you? I watched as Mr. Miller excused himself from the customer and came over to me. How do you know about my wife and her foot? I have my ways. I smiled as I continued. Do you want me to drop you off at the Triple Palm Motel tonight to meet Linda, since your car is by the mechanic? Mr. Miller was about to respond, but decided against it. Now you will go to the back and get every single copy that you made, as well as the original copy. He nodded and walked to the back. He returned a few moments later with the documents. And if I see or hear that anyone has purchased a copy of this, I will send it to your wife and daughter, Henriette. Do I make myself clear? Mr. Miller nodded. I smiled and exited the store. I invited every person who purchased a copy of the notes to a meeting. I was amazed at the number of students who turned up. Moving forward, we decided that everyone's name would go on a list and the teacher would give us all nothing less than a B plus. Instead of each person approaching certain teachers at different times, we made a pact to keep this a secret between us in order to protect ourselves. Needless to say, everything worked out well for the students and the college. The year I graduated, our college had the highest GPA in the country. That's the end of my story. But here's a final question I have for you viewers. If given the opportunity to get cheat notes on your teachers, would you use them? Comment your answers down below. I ran back outside, my heart hammering in my chest, and surveyed the area. My eyes searched wildly for her. She wasn't there. How did she slip away from right under my nose? This did not make any sense. I felt something at the back of my head and a voice from behind growled. Don't move. That was the last thing I heard before I was not unconscious. Crazy, isn't it? Minding my own business and wham. Continue to watch my story and you'll see how I ended up in that predicament. It all started a few months ago. I'm not a very good looking guy, or at least that's what I thought. When I met Samara, I was actually kind of, well, you know, shy. She made the first move and asked me out on a date. At first, I thought it was a trick, or even that she had lost a bet, or it was a dare. But then I realized she was really into me. I didn't waste time in asking her to be my steady girlfriend either. I knew I couldn't get better than her. At a very young age, Samara's parents passed away and she came to live with her uncle Henry, who was a scientist. That was supposed to be a temporary situation, but Samara didn't have much family, so she made Uncle Henry's home her own. Samara and I were total opposites. Where I was shy, she was outgoing and the most popular girl in school. All the jocks at school lingered on her every word because of her beauty and the nerds lingered on her every word because of her intelligence. Even though I knew I was dating out of my league, Samara only had eyes for me, which made me feel special. On the eve of my 16th birthday, Samara called me. Hey Anton, sorry for calling so late, but what are your plans for your birthday tomorrow? I was thinking maybe we could do something together? It's okay, I was just heading to bed. Well, my parents and I usually have dinner as a family, but I guess we can do something tomorrow night and I can get together on Saturday evening. Okay, great. You can pick me up at 6.30 and I'll treat you to dinner. Sounds good. Samara and I chatted for a few minutes before we hung up. Next evening, I picked Samara up at 6.30 and, as always, with a bouquet of flowers. She placed it in a vase before we headed to the car. I was a bit eager for our date tonight as I didn't know what to expect. How is Uncle Henry? You know. She looked a bit uneasy, then shrugged it off. Always working on the next new thing. He sent you birthday greetings, though. She said as I opened the door for her to get in. And what about his niece? Did she send any birthday greetings? I smiled mischievously and wiggled my eyebrows. Well... She pulled me close. 
I heard from a very reliable source that the niece has something very special planned. But that can only happen if the boyfriend gets behind the wheel. We don't want to miss our reservations. She giggled before she pushed me away playfully. I laughed and jogged around the car. I opened the car door and jumped in. Samara gave me the name of the restaurant, Jennifer's. When we got to the restaurant, Samara and the staff made a big hullabaloo about my birthday. The cake with the singing. There was even a live band who came to our table and played a song for me. Of course, when the birthday kiss was shared, the entire restaurant cheered. My face was red with all the attention. After dessert, Samara pulled out a box from her purse. And last but not least, this is for you. Her eyes sparkled lovingly. I took the gift-wrapped box from Samara and opened it. Inside was a gold wristband with my name engraved. I can't accept this. This is way too expensive. I pushed the wristband back into her hand. Anton, I want you to have it. You are the best boyfriend I have ever had. You've always been there for me, and I just wanted to show you a little appreciation. She took the wristband from the box and placed it on my wrist. I want you to have it. Please don't tell me that working extra shifts at Lola's with Patrick breathing down my neck was all for nothing. Samara shuddered. Thank you. I was still hesitant, but I didn't want Samara to feel bad. I've just never received anything like this before. After a few minutes, we called for the bill and we left. I dropped Samara home and thanked her for the night. I kissed her goodnight and watched as she walked to the front door. I drove off when she was safe inside. I looked back at the wristband inside. If I knew then what I know now, I would have never accepted the 16th birthday gift. That gift changed my life forever. Over the next two weeks, I hid the wristband from my parents because I knew they would tell me to give it back. However, I always wore it when I went out with Samara. Hey, I walked up behind Samara one afternoon outside the library. She spun around, eyes wide. Hey. She forced a smile. I held her hand and looked at her concerned. Are you okay? I'm fine. Are you ready? I nodded and we left for the mall. While walking through the mall, I noticed Samara got startled from sounds and looked over her shoulder numerous times. This behavior went on not just at the mall, but for a few days after, and each time she said she was fine. I wanted her to open up to me, but I also needed to give her time to do it at her own pace. One evening, Samara showed up at my front door. My parents were out at the time. Hey, can you drop me off at Antia's? Uncle Henry can't take me. I know it's last minute. She wrung her hands as she spoke. Sure, no problem. Let me just grab my keys and my jacket. In the car, Samara gave me directions to Aunt Tia's, who was about two hours away. We've been dating for six months and Samara never mentioned Aunt Tia to me. She looked out the window while I focused on driving. After about 15 minutes, I broke the silence. Samara, are you okay? I glanced over at her before I refocused on the road. She looked at me, her eyes filled with fear. There's something I need to tell you. She closed her eyes and inhaled deeply. Her voice shook as she spoke. Uncle Henry is after me. I shot her a confused look. After you? Yes, I took something from him and he wants it back. So why don't you just give it back? It's not that simple. I also don't have an Antia. What? So where are we going? I tilted my head as I looked across at Samara. I'm not sure. I need to figure out a way out of this. She shot me an apologetic look. Samara, you're not making any sense. At this point, I was a bit annoyed. Why did she lie to me? I hid the chip in your wristband and I think my uncle knows you have it, so he's after both of us. I pulled the car over to the side of the road. I took the wristband off and handed it to Samara. There's a lot at stake if he has what is on that chip. Samara took the wristband and shoved it into her purse. So then why not go to the police? Because I don't want anyone to get hurt. But you hid the chip in the wristband you gave to me. I yelled in disbelief. Look, Anton, I'm sorry, I panicked. If you can get me to point a pierre I'll be able to take it from there. There was an intense silence in the car. I was about to say something when I decided against it. I started the car and continued to point a pierre After about 30 minutes, I said dryly, I have to get gas. She nodded as I pulled into the gas station. I'll go in and pay for gas and get a bottle of water. Do you want anything? I shook my head. She hopped out of the car and disappeared into the store. I slammed my hands on the wheel frustratedly. I can't believe she got me wrapped up in all this. 15 minutes went by and Samara did not exit the store. Where is she? She should have been back by now. My eyes caught something in my rearview mirror. Was that a person? Were we followed? I sighed in relief when a cat came into view in my rearview mirror. I needed to get Samara. She was in there too long. I jumped out of the car and ran into the gas station. I looked around and Samara was nowhere to be found. 
After describing Samara to the cashier, I asked if he saw her. He said no. I ran back outside, my heart hammering in my chest, and surveyed the area. My eyes searched wildly for her. She wasn't here. How did she slip away from right under my nose? This did not make any sense. I felt something at the back of my head, and a voice from behind me growled, Don't move! That was the last thing I heard before I was knocked unconscious. I woke up feeling as though someone in my head was kicking and screaming to get out. I blinked a few times as I looked around, trying to figure out where I was. Thank you for joining us, Anton. Uncle Henry drawled. Where am I? Why am I tied up? I struggled violently against my ropes. There were three other men in the room. You are safe, for now. I'll let you go if you tell me the location of my niece and my chip. Your guess is as good as mine. She bailed on me at the gas station, and she also has the chip. I glared at Uncle Henry. Uncle Henry walked up to me briskly, grabbed a handful of my hair, and yanked my head back. I don't believe you heard me. Where is my niece and my chip? He snapped. I don't know where she is. My voice was strained. Ronnie! Yes, sir! One of the men stepped forward. His eyes grew dark as his lips curled into a lopsided grin. Help Anton remember where the chip is, and by extension, my niece. With that, Uncle Henry walked out of the room, and the three men walked towards me menacingly. Anton! Anton! Someone shook me and whispered in my ear. Come on, Anton, wake up! I opened my eyes as wide as I could. I felt a metallic taste of blood in my mouth. One of my eyes was almost swollen shut. I had cuts and bruises all over my body. How? I said weakly as she untied my hands and legs. My uncle used this place a few years back for one of his experiments. It was just a good guess. How did you get here? I saw your car stranded on the gas station and I used it. Now enough questions, let's go. Samara helped me up and tried to support my weight against her body, but I tumbled to the ground in pain. Just as Samara bent down to help me, I grabbed the ropes and pushed her onto the chair. Before she knew what had happened, I had her bound to the chair. She struggled against the ropes and looked at me in horror. What are you doing? What am I doing? I snarled angrily. You decided to plant a stolen chip in my wristband that you gave to me for my birthday. Then, you showed up on my doorstep and asked me to take you to your Aunt Tia's, and like the good boyfriend that I am, I was like, okay, sure. Look at my face, Samara. Look at it. I continued. And you dare to ask me what I'm doing? I never asked for this. I didn't deserve this. You should have told me the truth up front and let me decide if I wanted to get mixed up in this. Now it's too late for that. <laughs> Tears ran down Samara's face, and I looked at her in disgust. Oh, please, save yourself the pity party. You caused this yourself. I didn't take you to be a coward, Anton. I thought I could trust you, but I was wrong. She spat. Trust? You want to talk about trust after you lured me out of my house under false pretense? <clears throat> I cleared my throat. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to meet with your uncle. Samara screamed and pulled hard against the ropes. You can't give him the chip. You can't. I opened her purse and got my keys in the wristband. You think I can't hand this over to your uncle? I bet you $100,000 that I can. At least your uncle was honest with me. I can't say that about you, can I? As I turned and walked away, Samara called behind me. If Uncle Henry gets that chip, nobody will be safe. I laughed cynically <laughs> as I turned and faced her. At this point, whatever your uncle does with the chip is his business. But I'm not going to go through everything that I did tonight and leave empty-handed. Oh, and by the way, your uncle told everyone you went away to visit your Aunt Tia in another country, so no one is coming for you. No! Samara screamed. Before I exited the room, I turned off the light and locked the door behind me. I arrived at Uncle Henry's house about an hour later. As promised, he handed me the cash. He also had his men clean the interior and exterior of my car to make sure that Samara's prints were not on it. They also erased my GPS just in case anybody thought to look at it. I kept the money hidden from my parents, and as soon as I left school, Uncle Henry asked if I wanted a job at his lab, which I accepted. In my short time on this earth, I've learned two things. The first is just because you love someone, that does not give you the right to put them in difficult situations and demand that they help you. The second one is to keep your friends close and your enemies closer. I watched as Billy walked into the cafeteria. As usual, she was surrounded by her group of friends. I had been wanting to ask her out on a date for ages, but I could never catch her on her own. I had decided that I couldn't wait any longer. There was nothing else for it. I was going to have to ask her in front of everyone. I waited until she and her friends got their lunches and sat down at a table. Right then, Craig, it's now or never. I took a deep breath and casually wandered over to their table. Hi there. 
Billy looked up at me. She had a puzzled look on her face. Are you talking to me? Uh, yeah. Uh, hi there. I, listen, I was, uh, wondering, uh... Come on, spit it out. Would you like to go out on a date with me? Uh, no thanks. I was so embarrassed. I didn't know what to say. I actually thought I was going to burst into tears. I had been waiting for that moment for so long, only to be rejected. As I walked away, I could hear her friends giggling. But before I go on, make sure you like and subscribe and hit that notification bell to make sure you don't ever get rejected. I sat down in the corner all on my own with my head bowed down. I felt so miserable. I couldn't believe she had humiliated me like that in front of everyone. Suddenly, I felt someone sitting down beside me. Are you okay, Craig? I looked up to see who had spoken. It was Lara, a girl in my class. Yeah, I'm okay, seeing as I've just been rejected. Well, maybe you asked the wrong girl out. What do you mean? I mean, maybe you should ask someone else out. Someone who maybe has a crush on you. Like who? Isn't it obvious? Not to me. She gave an exasperated sigh and said, <sighs> How about me? I looked at her in shock. Are you saying you have a crush on me? Yes, Craig, that's what I'm saying. And I'm also asking if you would like to go out on a date with me. Even though it was the last thing I expected, I didn't have to think twice. Lara was a pretty girl. Anyone would be lucky to go out on a date with her. That sounds great, Lara. Where shall we go? How about we go out for a pizza tonight? That sounds perfect. I couldn't believe that everything had turned around so quickly. Five minutes ago, I'd been nursing a broken heart. And now I had a date to look forward to. See you at about 7 o'clock at the Italian cafe then. I smiled to myself as Lara walked off. Maybe this was all supposed to happen this way. I guess fate was playing a hand. That evening was one of the best times of my life. Lara and I got on so well. She was so funny and really cute too. Even the waiter laughed at her silly jokes. I felt like I had known her for years. It definitely didn't feel like it was our first date. At the end of the night, I walked her home. Well, that was a fun night, wasn't it? Yes, I had a good time. Do you want to do something on Friday? Maybe the movies. Or we could go roller skating or something. The movie sounds great. I felt really nervous and didn't know whether to give her a kiss or just say goodnight. But after a few seconds of pondering, I decided to go for it. I leaned toward her and gave her a kiss on her cheek. Good night then. Good night. As I walked home alone, my heart was singing with joy and I could hardly take the grin off my face. When I got in, my mom was waiting up for me. How did your day go, Craig? Really good. She's so nice and she's agreed to go out on another date with me on Friday. That's great. I'm really happy for you. From that moment on, Lara became a big part of my life. We spent all our free time together. It wasn't long before we made it official. All of our friends were really happy for us. You two are perfect for each other. You make a really good couple. I was on cloud nine. I didn't think anything or anyone could spoil how I was feeling. But I hadn't thought about what Billy might say. Once she found out that Lara and I were boyfriend and girlfriend, she started being really mean. Everywhere we went, she would always seem to be there, sticking her nose in. Oh, where are the lovebirds going now? Oh, you two are so cute. Not... I tried to ignore her teasing, but it started to get me down. Lara noticed that I wasn't my usual self. What's up, Craig? You seem so sad. Yes, I guess I'm feeling a bit low. I explained to Lara that Billy's constant teasing was really upsetting me. I know I shouldn't let it get to me, but I can't help it. Don't worry about Billy. I will handle her. I'll make sure she doesn't upset you anymore. And anyway, we have the weekend to look forward to now. You won't have to see Billy again until Monday. Yes, that's true. But as luck would have it, when we got to school on Monday, Billy was nowhere to be seen. Billy must be sick or something. At least I won't have to listen to her teasing today. Yes, I guess she must be. Billy didn't come into school the next day or the following day either. In fact, a week went by and no one had heard anything from her. I began to feel a bit concerned. I couldn't help but remember what Lara had said. I decided I would have to ask her. Lara, you don't know why Billy hasn't been at school all week, do you? No, how would I know? Oh, nothing. It's just, uh... Just what? Well, you did say you would take care of her. Lara started laughing. I only meant I would ask her to leave us alone, that's all. I don't know what's happened to her any more than you do. Oh, yeah, of course. You do believe me, don't you? Yes, yes, of course I do. Hey, my parents are out this evening. Do you want to come over to my house? We can watch a movie. Sure, that sounds like a great plan. So that evening, I went over to Lara's. We were halfway through the movie when Lara said that she would go to get us some snacks. Okay, I need to go to the bathroom anyway. 
I got up and went to find the bathroom, but I hadn't been in Lara's house very often and somehow I managed to get myself lost. I had no idea which room was the bathroom. As I was going from door to door, I didn't see Lara's little brother had left his toy on the floor. I tripped over it and went flying into a bookcase. As I did so, I knocked one of the books off the shelf. Suddenly, the whole bookcase opened up like a door, revealing a secret room behind it. I was so surprised and curiosity got the better of me. I decided I would take a quick peek into the secret room. When I saw what was inside, my mouth fell in shock. In the middle of the room was a cage, and inside it, chained to a chair, was Billy. Ah, what are you doing here? You have to help me. Quick, come and undo these chains. I wouldn't do that if I were you. I turned around to see Lara standing behind me. What's going on, Lara? Why is Billy in your house? This is revenge for all the mean things she has done to you. But you can't chain her up. It's only what she deserves. No one teases you like that and gets away with it. I know what she did was wrong, but what you are doing is even worse. I can't let you keep her here any longer. I'm going to set her free. I went over to the entrance into the cage and began to unlock it. But before I had the chance to open the door, I felt something hard hit me on the back of the head. Within seconds, everything went black and I fell to the floor with a thud. I don't know how long I was unconscious for, but when I woke up, I found myself inside the cage with Billy. Lara was on the outside of the cage. She was pacing around and had a crazy look on her face. I knew that there was no way she was going to let us out of there. So I decided I would pretend that I had changed my mind. You're right, Lara. She does deserve to be chained up. Don't worry, I'm gonna help you. I won't tell anyone that you've kidnapped her. It'll be our little secret. When Billy heard what I was saying, she started going crazy. What? You can't keep me locked up in here. Why are you taking her side? Because she's my girlfriend and she's right. You have been mean to me. Lara smiled at me when she heard what I was saying. Let me out now, Lara. We can carry on watching the rest of the movie. She seemed to hesitate for a minute, but then she came over and opened the door to the cage. As soon as she did, I jumped out and knocked her to the floor. Before she had time to get up again, I went inside the cage and undid the chains that were tying Billy to the chair. I'm sorry, Lara. I can't go along with your plan. Come on, Billy. Let's get out of here. We went out of the secret room and back downstairs. When we got to the bottom of the stairs, I could hear voices in the kitchen. It was Lara's parents. They had obviously just gotten home. I went through and began telling them everything that had happened. They were really shocked, and when I got to the part about Lara putting Billy in chains, their faces fell. Her mom started crying, and her dad put his arms around her to comfort her. We'd better call the police and let them know what has happened. Lara's mom looked heartbroken, but she didn't say anything. She just nodded in agreement. Just as Lara's dad was putting the phone down, Lara appeared in the doorway of the kitchen. Laura, how could you do this again? What? What do you mean again? Has Lara done something like this before? I think we'd better explain everything to you, Craig. Lara's mom told me that Lara had done the same thing before. It was while she was dating her previous boyfriend. An old girlfriend of his showed up at his house one night and Laura got really jealous. She took the girl hostage. It was weeks before she was found. We sent her to a mental hospital for treatment. She spent a few weeks there, and when she came out, it seemed like she had recovered. Honestly, we thought she was fine now. We never expected her to do anything like this again. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I really didn't know what to say next. But I didn't need to say anything because the police turned up and did all the talking. After Lara's parents had explained to them exactly what had gone on, they told them that they would need to take Lara into custody. It's for her own good, until she can be addressed. But when they tried to take Lara out to the police car, she started screaming. No, no, I'm not going back there. Craig, help me. You love me, don't you? Don't let them take me away. I turned away from Lara. I couldn't bear to hear her cries for help. Billy and I left Lara's house and started walking home. When we got to the end of the road, I turned to go to the left but Billy went in the opposite direction. Bye then, Billy. I couldn't believe it. She totally ignored me. Not even a word of thanks for saving her. I felt really sad. Billy was once again being mean to me, and now I didn't even have Lara to comfort me. Later that evening, I was sitting in the lounge watching the TV with my parents when suddenly the program was interrupted by a newsreader. Breaking news. We interrupt our programs to bring you some urgent news. This evening, a patient at the mental hospital escaped and fled the building. She is not believed to be dangerous, but the public should call authorities if they see anyone acting suspiciously. Before I had time to digest what I had heard, the doorbell rang. 
I stood up and went to answer it. When I opened the door, I was shocked to see Lara standing there. Lara, what are you doing here? She ran inside and put her arms around me. She hugged me so tightly, I could hardly breathe. I've missed you so much. Don't ever leave me again. Now we can be together forever. Then she moved her hands up and wrapped them around my neck. Her grip tightened around my throat. I gulped. I watched as Lucas walked along the school corridor. He was so handsome and one of the most popular boys in the school. Everyone wanted to date him, including my best friend Julia and me. Look who it is, I said to Julia. Yes, and look who's behind him. <laughs> She replied, giggling. I turned to see who she was looking at. It was Dylan. He was one of the ugliest boys in the school, inside and out. But before I go on, make sure you like and subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on any more crazy stories. Julie and I had agreed a long time ago that we would never fall out over a boy. That's why we didn't mind that both of us liked Lucas. But so far, neither of us had gotten anywhere with him. We really need to up our game, Julia, I said. Of course, I want to date him, but if it's you that he wants to date, then I would be fine with that. But it would be terrible if neither of us dated him. You know what, Abigail? I think we should make this interesting, said Julia. In what way? I think we should make a little bet. Whoever's the one that gets a date with Lucas is the winner, but the loser has to date Dylan. The thought of having to date Dylan was enough to spur me on. There was no way I was going to lose. You'd better start preparing yourself for your date with Dylan, I told Julia. You're kidding, aren't you? I'm going to be dating Lucas before you know it, she replied. With that, I watched as she ran off and caught up with Lucas. She walked all the way to class with him. I saw that he was laughing at something she had said. I knew that I really needed to come up with a good plan to get him. So, I decided that I would hold a singing competition. Everyone in school had to enter because it was for charity. I organized it with the music teacher and told all the kids that they had to sing a song. Friday afternoon when school finished, instead of heading off straight home, we all piled into the main hall. One by one, all of the kids stood up on the stage and sang the song they had prepared. Some of them weren't too bad, but some were terrible. Next, it was Julia's turn to get up on stage. Go on, Julia. What are you waiting for? I asked. She turned to me and scowled. I can't believe you've done this. You know I can't sing. <laughs> I just laughed. Don't be silly. It's all a bit of fun. Julia got up on stage and began to sing. I had never heard anything like it. The sound coming out of her mouth was like a cross between owls screeching and babies screaming. Everyone put their hands to their ears. I looked over at Lucas to see what his reaction was. His face was contorted as though he was in real pain. Next, it was my turn to get up and sing. I picked up the microphone and began to sing. Immediately, everyone stopped what they were doing and just stood and stared at me. I had always been a good singer, but I had never sung in front of an audience before. When I finished, everyone started clapping and cheering. The music teacher stood up and said, well, kids, I think we have our winner. I smiled as she handed me my winning trophy. As I walked off the stage, I made sure to walk past Lucas. Well done, Abigail. You have a great voice. Thank you, Lucas. That means a lot. My heart was literally singing inside. I felt sure that it wouldn't be long before he asked me out on a date. That was so embarrassing, said Julia. You weren't that bad, I told her. I bet Lucas thinks I'm a complete idiot. I wanted to agree with her, but didn't want to appear mean. So I just told her that I was sure he wouldn't hold it against her. When I got home that evening, I was so happy. I lay in bed dreaming about my date with Lucas. The following morning, I was doing some chores for my mom when the phone rang. It was Julia. Sorry, Abigail, I'm not going to be able to come shopping with you today. I'm not feeling that great. Oh, that's a shame. Well, I hope you'll feel better soon. I put the phone down. I was disappointed that Julia had canceled our plans. I'd been looking forward to going into town all week. I wanted to buy myself a new dress and shoes. Oh well, there's nothing stopping me from going shopping on my own. I got myself ready and took the bus into town. I looked around the shops for a while, trying on dresses and shoes until I found exactly what I was looking for. Once I had made my purchases, I realized that I was feeling really hungry. I think I'll go and get myself a burger. A new American diner had just opened in town and I had been wanting to try it for ages. I decided that I would go there and get some lunch. 
When I got there, the place was really busy. I asked the waitress for a table for one person, and she told me to follow her. As we made our way through the diner, I looked around at the people dining there. All of a sudden, I stopped in my tracks. I couldn't believe my eyes. There was Julia, and she was sitting with Lucas. My mouth dropped open in shock. Just at that moment, Julia looked up and caught my eye. She smiled at me and waved. Come and join us, she called out. I wandered over to their table. Hi there, what are you two doing? I asked. Oh, Lucas asked me out on a date. My stomach literally turned over. I couldn't believe it. Julia had won the bet. Now I was going to have to date Dylan. Oh really, that's so nice. It was the least I could do after last night's singing fiasco, said Lucas. I could see she needed cheering up. I couldn't believe that my plan had backfired. I hadn't expected Lucas to feel sorry for Julia. I thought that he would want to date me because of my amazing voice. Well, have fun, you two. Aren't you staying? Asked Julia. Nope, I've suddenly lost my appetite. I left the diner and went home. I hadn't been home long when I got a text from Julia. Don't forget to ask Dylan for a date. I threw the phone across the room. Ugh. Just the thought of going on a date with Dylan made my stomach turn. But I knew I had no choice. A bet is a bet. Monday morning at school, I went straight up to Dylan. I knew there was no point in delaying it. Hi, Dylan. Can I ask you something? If you want. Would you like to go on a date with me? Yeah, okay, sure. We arranged to meet up the following weekend. I really wasn't looking forward to our date, but I hate to admit it. I actually had a really good time. Dylan was really funny and really nice to me. He was a real gentleman, held doors open for me, and just made sure I had a really good time. The day after my date, I met up with Julia. How did your date with Dylan go? It went really well. He's a really nice guy. How about you? How are you and Lucas getting on? Julia looked a bit miserable. To be honest, he's actually a bit mean. What do you mean? He's always late for our dates and never apologizes. He's also a bit boring. The following week, it was Valentine's Day. I wasn't expecting Dylan to get me anything. After all, we had only been on a couple of dates. I was sitting in my bedroom when I heard my mom calling me from downstairs. I went down and there was Dylan standing in my hallway with the biggest bunch of flowers I had ever seen. Happy Valentine's Day, Abigail. I took the flowers from him, blushing. Thank you, Dylan. They're beautiful. Later that afternoon, I called Julia and told her what Dylan had bought for me. What about you? What did you get from Lucas? Nothing. Not even a card. I was really confused. I had always heard that Lucas was a really nice, generous person. Everyone praised him. And actually thinking about it, people had always said that Dylan was really mean and nasty. It just doesn't make sense. Don't worry too much about it. Anyway, don't forget, we have Isabel's pool party to look forward to. I said, yes, I can't wait. It'll be so much fun. Isabel was having a pool party for her 16th birthday. Her parents had a huge house and everyone in our year was invited. It was going to be the party of the year. I went to the party with Dylan and as soon as we got there, we went to find Julia and Lucas. They were sitting on sunbeds at the side of the pool. Come on, what are you waiting for? Let's get in the pool. Julia and I dove straight in. When we came back to the surface, Lucas and Dylan were still sitting on the sunbeds. Come on, you two. It's gorgeous in here. Maybe later, said Dylan. Julia and I swam off to join some of our friends. I don't know what's up with those two, she said. Never mind. We will have fun even if they don't. We spent the whole afternoon splashing about in the pool. Dylan and Lucas didn't even get their toes wet. We started arranging a lot of double dates for the four of us. But the more time I spent with them, I realized that Julia was right. Lucas wasn't that nice of a person. I was really pleased that I had lost the bet. Dylan was such a nice guy and treated me really well. I was so happy. Let's go to the beach on Sunday, I said to Dylan. We'll invite Julia and Lucas too. Dylan wasn't that keen at first, but he eventually agreed. Sunday morning, we set off to the beach. As soon as we got there, Julia and I changed into our swimsuits and headed into the ocean for a swim. The boys sat looking at their phones. Why don't you come in the water? It's so hot out here. Surely you want to cool off. But neither Lucas or Dylan seemed interested in going for a swim. Julia and I just looked at each other and shrugged our shoulders. It's a bit weird that neither of them want to get in the water, isn't it? She said. Maybe we should organize a picnic in the park next weekend. I said. They'll probably enjoy that more. The following weekend, we packed up a picnic basket with sandwiches and drinks and set off to the park. 
Lucas brought a ball along and the boys played football whilst Julie and I prepared our lunch. This was a good idea, she said. The boys seem much happier here than at the beach. Yeah, they look like they're having a good time. We got all the food out and shouted to the boys to come and get something to eat. They came running over and sat down on the picnic rug. We had just started eating when all of a sudden there was a huge clap of thunder, followed by a flash of lightning. Oh no, looks like there's going to be a storm, I said. We quickly started packing up all the food, but just as we had got it all in the basket, the heavens opened up and the rain came pouring down. There was nowhere for us to shelter. We began to make a run for it, but all of a sudden, Julia let out a scream. Lucas, what's happening to your face? She cried. I turned to look at Lucas. I couldn't believe what I saw. His face was literally melting away. Dylan, it's happening to you too, said Julia. I looked at Dylan and it was true. His face was melting too. At first I was horrified, but slowly as his face melted away, I saw what was hidden underneath. Wait a minute, you're not Dylan, you're Lucas, I said. Julia looked at me. You haven't been dating Dylan at all. All along you were dating Lucas. I think you owe us an explanation, boys, I said. Dylan, or rather, Lucas, looked at me. I'm sorry we tricked you, but we just wanted to conduct a little experiment of our own. Lucas explained that him and Dylan had come up with a plan to see if girls actually dated someone for their look or for their personality too. They had put on masks of each other's faces to trick us into thinking they were the other person. It turns out that you didn't care that I wasn't good looking. You still wanted to date me because I treated you nicely, said the real Lucas. After we found out who we really were dating, things changed for Julia. She decided that she wasn't going to put up with Dylan being mean to her any longer. She broke up with him. I hadn't been bothered that my boyfriend wasn't good looking. I was happy at the time because he treated me well. But I have to admit, it's even better now that I'm dating the gorgeous Lucas. As I lay near my parents' bed with my phone in hand ready to record, I could feel my heart pounding against my chest. This was an invasion of privacy, and my hands trembled at the thought of what I might hear that night. But what I heard was even more traumatizing than the sounds I thought I was going to hear. Hi, my name is Grace. Before I unfold my story, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. Hit that notification bell too so you know when new content is available. If you do, you will live a long and prosperous life. Hey, why don't we play a game of truth and dare? Camille asked and she busted open a pack of potato chips. My parents, Dad Wade and stepmother Josie, had long been in bed and my friends and I were having our sleepover before exams began. Sheets, blankets, pillows, stuffed animals, and snacks filled the TV room floor that night. Michelle, Alexis, Jody, Katie, and Samantha nodded and agreed that it was a great idea. We did the usual things in our truth or dare such as make embarrassing videos, spill our deepest darkest secrets, we even kissed each other, but those were all simple compared to the hell that was infringed upon me when I decided to choose dare. Samantha looked at me shyly and said, Grace, I dare you to spend the night under your parents' bed. You must not just record everything, but also send it to your best friends so that we know that you completed the task. Ew, I said in horror. You can't be serious about that dare. I'm not doing that. You need to change it. Do you all remember when Grace dared me to go into the boys' bathroom and stay there the entire lunch period? Grace, you were doing this dare. Jody laughed. <laughs> but guys, these are my parents. Do you know what could happen if I got caught? Just get caught? Alexa shrugged as she popped a potato chip into her mouth. I was hesitant because I didn't even want to think about what happened in my parents' room at night. After much coaxing, I exclaimed, Fine, I'll be a good sport and do my dare. They all cheered and we decided to watch a few movies before going to sleep. Dad, I'm heading to the shower if anyone needs me, I yelled. Okay, Gracie, he replied. I went into the bathroom and I turned the shower on. I peeked out the bathroom door before coming out. I came out of the bathroom and quickly locked the door with the key. I quickly headed to my parents' room with the phone to complete my dare. I had just slipped under the bed when I heard my parents enter the room. I folded my lips in to ensure no sound could escape my mouth. What's going on, Wade? You've been on edge the whole afternoon, Josie said. I watched as my father paced the bedroom floor. Zara wants to come see me. Zara? Zara as in your ex-wife, Zara? Josie asked. Yes, that Zara. She said that she may have found something that may be a lead to her daughter that went missing, my dad said. So why is that a problem? Josie asked in a confused voice. There was a few minutes of silence while my dad paced the room, then he stopped abruptly. 
there is something that I need to tell you. I don't want you to think any differently of me, and I don't want you to leave me. He pleaded. I lay quietly in the shadows under the bed, wondering what the secret was that my father was about to disclose to Josie. Nothing in the world could have prepared me for what my father said next. The courts did not give me custody of Grace. I kidnapped her, my dad said. You did what? Josie asked, horrified. Baby, baby, shh, please, I don't want Grace to hear. You need to start explaining and quickly, Wade. My father went on to tell my stepmother that he kidnapped me when I was five from my mother's house. They were in a custody battle, and when I went missing, nobody questioned him since he showed up to court and went through the motions of being a distraught father. He actually paid a friend of his to hold me for a few months until everything died down. My hair was dyed, cut low, and wore boy clothes so that I wouldn't resemble any of the missing person pictures that were posted. I placed my hand over my mouth to stop the sounds that were trying to escape. Josie didn't say anything for a while, and then she asked, What are you going to do? You know she can't come here, or she'll see pictures of Grace and put two and two together. I couldn't believe my ears. Instead of calling the police, she was asking him what he was going to do. My dad was never big on technology, so I wasn't on any of the popular social media apps, and now I knew why my father raised me that way. Every time I asked my father about my mother, he told me that she was crazy and spent her days in asylums. Finding out that my father lied to me all these years and that my mother was alive and looking for me created conflicting feelings within me. There's a dessert place on Henry Street that usually doesn't have a lot of customers. I'll ask her to meet me there and hear what information she has. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to keep my daughter, even if it means disposing of Zara. My eyes widened. I wanted to get out from under the bed. I wanted to confront my father, but I had no choice to stay. The man that raised me was not the man that was speaking this way. He was a monster. <laughs> Josie didn't say anything. She suggested that they watch a movie downstairs to keep my father's mind off things. As soon as my parents left the bedroom, I quickly came from under the bed and ran to my bedroom. It wasn't until my dad knocked on the door and entered that I remember the shower was on. Gracie, you forgot the shower on, he said. Sorry, Dad. I gulped. I came back to my room to get something and I got sidetracked. I lied. Later at dinner, I kept quiet, mulling in my own thoughts. If my father and stepmother realized that I was acting strange during dinner, they didn't say anything. That night, I stayed up and thought about how I was going to deal with the situation. I was 15 years old, which meant that my dad kept me from my mother for 10 years. How was that even possible? The next day, my friends asked me about the recordings, and I told them I couldn't give it to them. They teased me about wimping out, but when they realized how upset I was, they realized that something was wrong. They asked me to share what was happening with them, but I couldn't. If I told them, my dad would be taken to jail before I would have a chance to be reunited with my mother. I wanted to see my mom, and I decided that when my father was going to go meet her, I would follow him. The next few days, I wasn't allowed to go out of the house alone. I was dropped and picked up at school. I wasn't allowed to walk to and from school with my friends anymore. When I asked why, my father was unable to give me a straight answer. When my father finally set a time to meet my mother, I was relieved, but also afraid for her. What if she found out too much and he decided to get rid of her? I wasn't about to lose my mother a second time. I knew where the dessert shop was located in town, and I snuck out of my window and got there before my father did. I ordered a donut so that I wouldn't catch any prying eyes as to why I was lurking in the shop. I sat in the innermost part of the shop with a cap on and a newspaper held open in front of me as though I was reading it, and I waited. About 20 minutes later, a shadow fell over me, and a familiar voice came from the other side of the paper. Hi, Grace, Josie said. I was about to lower the paper, but she stopped me. Keep the paper up, and I want you to sit there and listen to what I have to say, she said, and continued. I suspected that you heard the secret that your father disclosed to me the other night in the bedroom. The past few days, you've avoided your father and I when possible. I decided to check the security cameras, and I saw you sneaking in and out of our room. I erased the footage so your father wouldn't know. I admire your spunk for wanting to come down here and meet your mother, and probably save her from whatever demise your father has for her. But what you are doing is dangerous, and you should not be here. It's my mom, I said. Because of him, she missed out on 10 years of my life. Grace, I need you to trust me. I need you to get up and go behind the counter, now. Josie said, her voice slightly raised. Josie had never spoken to me that way before, and I felt obligated to trust her. I wondered if this time I bit into more than I could chew. 
I was a bit worried as to what Josie had planned for my dad and my mom. She spoke softly to the employee behind the counter, and they opened the side hatch and allowed me to enter. I watched as Josie took my spot and sat as though she was reading the newspaper. The employee urged me to go to the back room, but I decided to hide behind the counter. I peeked over the countertop and watched as my father and mother walked into the shop, laughing and chatting with each other. They sat by one of the round tables and leaned in closely to each other as they spoke. I looked over at Josie who held their position. Suddenly, officers in all black, complete with masks, entered the front and back of the building and surrounded the table that my father and my mother sat by. I looked on as not one, but both my parents were handcuffed and escorted outside despite their protest. I was quite confused. After my mom and dad were escorted outside, I watched as one of the officers shook Josie's hand before he exited the building. I ran out from behind the counter and snatched the newspapers from her hand and flung it on the ground. How dare you? I screamed at her. What did you do? What did my mother ever do to you? I wanted to meet my mother. Josie looked at me, unmoved by my behavior. If you give me a chance, I would love to explain everything to you. She said, pointing at the chair opposite of her. I reluctantly sat down and glared at Josie. I went into labor almost 16 years ago. Things started off great. And then about two hours in, things became complicated. I had to be rushed to surgery for a C-section. I watched as Josie's eyes filled with tears, but she continued. My baby was so cute and had the cutest heart-shaped birthmark on her butt. Josie giggled as she wiped away her tears. The antibiotics that I was given weren't agreeing with me, and the nurses began to take care of my baby. One such nurse was Mackenzie Bell, or you may know her as Zara Hope. My head tilted to the side and I watched Josie, puzzled. One night, while at the hospital, Mackenzie told me that my baby girl was having trouble breathing, so she took her away. Later on, they said that my baby had passed away. Mackenzie also mysteriously disappeared. That same day, I knew something wasn't right. I knew my baby was still alive somewhere. She looked at me and smiled. That baby was you. My mouth opened, but no words came out. My brain was on overdrive. I couldn't believe it. Neither parents were actually my parents. I never stopped looking for you. And when I did find you, I vowed that I would never lose you again. I only married Wade because it meant being closer to you. We have been searching for Mackenzie for years. And when she contacted Wade, we saw it as a blessing. She said as she reached out to squeeze my hands that were on the table. Josie said that if it would make me feel better, that we could go do DNA test. It took two grueling weeks for us to get the results. The test proved positive, that Josie was my real mother. My life changed drastically, all because my friends and I decided to play a game of truth or dare. Hallo, mein Name ist Dylan und ich habe eine verrückte, herzzerreißende Geschichte. Aber ich überlasse es euch, das zu beurteilen. Bevor ich beginne, drückt bitte den Gefällt mir und Abonnieren Button und vergesst nicht die Benachrichtigungsglocke für weitere tolle Geschichten zu aktivieren. Ich bin 17 und lebte alleine mit meiner Mutter seit ich sieben Jahre alt war, weil meine Eltern sich getrennt haben. Ich erinnere mich, dass wir eine wirklich glückliche Familie waren und dann packte mein Vater eines Tages seine Koffer und ging. Ich habe überhaupt nichts mehr von ihm gesehen oder gehört. Er hat mich nicht einmal angerufen oder mir Geburtstagskarten geschickt. Ich weiß, dass man sagt, dass Jungs ihre Emotionen verstecken sollen, aber ich konnte es nicht. Das machte mich wirklich traurig und ich weinte und verbrachte viel Zeit allein in meinem Zimmer. Dann, an einem Weihnachten, bekam ich von meiner Mutter ein Tortendekorationsset geschenkt. Man könnte meinen, dass ein Junge sich nicht über so ein Geschenk freuen würde. Aber ich war so begeistert. Eine meiner Lieblingsbeschäftigungen war es, die Backsendungen im Fernsehen anzuschauen. Und im Alter von zehn Jahren konnte ich bereits viele verschiedene Arten von Kuchen backen. Sie schmecken besser als alles, was man in einer Bäckerei kaufen konnte. Aber ich will nicht prahlen. Nachdem ich mein Dekorationskit bekommen hatte, verbrachte ich Tage damit, verschiedene Tortendekorationsmuster zu lernen. Ich hatte so viel Spaß. Backen und Dekorieren waren die einzige Dinge, durch die ich mich in meinem Leben besser fühlte. Später sahen die Dinge für mich besser aus. Als ich 15 Jahre alt war, ging ich auf die Highschool wie jede normale Teenager. Aber ich hatte einen Teilzeitjob in einem Restaurant. Ich war eine Art Praktikant und musste den Konditor folgen und lernen, was er tat. Ich brauchte das für meinen Lebenslauf, weil ich mich für ein Stipendium an einer der besten Konditorenschule des Landes beworben hatte. Wenn ich es schaffen würde, könnte ich die Highschool früher verlassen und direkt dorthin gehen. Wenn ich die Schule verließ, wäre ich ein qualifizierender Konditor und könnte mein Leben damit verbringen, das zu tun, was ich am meisten liebe. 
Meine Mutter und ich hatten auch eine tolle Beziehung zueinander. Es war fast so, als ob sie meine Schwester wäre. Wir konnten über alles lachen und als ich älter wurde, haben wir immer gelacht und uns gegenseitig Streiche gespielt. Ich liebte es, ihre Streiche zu spielen, sie aufzunehmen und ihre Reaktion auf meinen YouTube-Kanal hochzuladen. Eines Abends kam ich vorher von der Arbeit nach Hause und ich dachte mir den perfekten Streich aus. Ich baute die Kamera am Wohnzimmer auf und wartete, bis sie nach Hause kam. Sobald sie durch die Tür kam, sagte ich, Mom, bitte reg dich nicht auf. Ich habe eine sehr beunruhigende Nachricht. Was ist denn los, Schatz? fragte sie und sah besorgt aus. Es geht um meine Freundin. Ich glaube, sie ist schwanger, antwortete ich. Sie keuchte. Aber Dylan, du hast doch gar keine Freundin. Habe ich doch. Ich habe dir nur nie von ihr erzählt. Wir gehen jetzt seit ungefähr sechs Monaten miteinander aus, erwiderte ich. Sechs Monaten? Und du hast sie schon geschwängert? Ich dachte, ich hätte dich besser erzogen als das, schrie sie. Sie zog ihre Schuhe aus und begann mir auf den Kopf zu schlagen. Mom, Mom, es ist nur ein Streich, ich habe keine Freundin, sagte ich und wir lachten beide, bis wir weinten. Das war ein Hit bei meinen Abonnenten. Ich glaube, das war das letzte Mal, dass ich wirklich glücklich war. Etwa einen Monat später wendete sich das Blatt zum Schlechten. Eines Abends arbeitete ich bis spät in die Nacht im Restaurant und mein Chef kam mit einem strengen Gesichtsausdruck herein. Da ist jemand für dich am Telefon, sagte er. Er sah verärgert aus, weil wir keine Anrufe auf dem Firmentelefon entgegennehmen durften. Ich fragte mich, warum diese Person nicht stattdessen einfach meine Handynummer wählte. Ich wusch mir die Hände und ging zum Hörer. Hallo, sagte ich. Wir haben deine Mutter, sagte eine schroffe Mannstimme am anderen Ende. Was soll das heißen, fragte ich. Wir werden ihr etwas antun, wenn du nicht bald kommst, sagte er. Was wollt ihr von mir? Wo sind sie? fragte ich. Er gab mir eine Adresse, die zwei Blocks entfernt war und erinnerte mich daran, dass er meine Mutter etwas antun würde, wenn ich nicht schnell genug dorthin käme. Ich hatte keine Zeit zum Nachdenken und mein Herz raste. Ich hatte bereits meinen Vater verloren und ich konnte mir nicht vorstellen, auch noch meine Mutter zu verlieren. Ich sagte nichts zu meinem Chef und rannte aus dem Restaurant, bis ich die Adresse erreichte, die mir der Mann am Telefon genannt hatte. Ich schaute mich um und sah niemanden. Die Straße war frei und ich stand nur vor einem seltsamen Tor. Plötzlich öffnete sie sich und ein alter Mann in einem dreiteiligen Anzug kam heraus. Ich weiß nicht, warum ich es tat, aber ich erhob meine Faust und schlug auf ihn ein. »Wo ist meine Mutter?« schrie ich, als der Mann vor Schmerzen zu Boden fiel. Dann kam eine Frau aus der Tür und begann zu schreien. »Mein Opa! Mein Großvater! Was haben Sie mit ihm gemacht? Ich werde Sie dafür verhaften lassen! Ich rufe die Polizei!« sagte sie. Mir wurde klar, dass ich einen großen Fehler begangen hatte und ich fragte mich, ob ich zur falschen Adresse gegangen war. Ich konnte nichts anderes tun, als so schnell wie möglich zu rennen. Ich rannte und rannte bis zu meiner Haustür. Ich öffnete schnell die Tür und schloss sie hinter mir. Ich schaute mich im Wohnzimmer um und meine Mutter saß da und sah seelenruhig fern. »Mom, du bist in Sicherheit. Ich habe mich so erschrocken. Was machst du denn hier? Haben sie dich gehen lassen? Ich habe mir solche Sorgen gemacht«, sagte ich, während ich zitterte. »Haha, ich habe mich für den blöden Schwangerschaftsstreich revanchiert, den du abgezogen hast. Guck mal, ich habe diese coole Stimmveränderungs-App heruntergeladen«, lachte sie, während sie ihr Handy herauszog. Sie lachte eine Zeit lang, bis sie merkte, dass ich nicht lachte. In der Tat glaube ich, dass ich ziemlich erschrocken aussah. »Was ist denn los, Schatz? Es war doch nur ein kleiner Streich. Warum siehst du so am Boden zerstört aus?«, fragte sie. »Ich glaube, ich habe einen alten Mann umgebracht«, schrie ich. Ein paar Augenblicke später klopfte es laut an der Tür. Meine Mutter öffnete sie und zwei Polizisten kamen herein. Sie wurden von der Enkelin des alten Mannes begleitet. »Ist er das?«, fragte einer der Polizisten. »Ja, das ist er«, sagte sie. »Ich weiß gar nicht, wie sie mich so schnell finden konnten. Ich wurde weggefahren und weil ich zu jung war, um ins Gefängnis zu gehen, verbrachte ich die Nacht in einer Jugendstrafanstalt. Sie sagten mir, dass ich in ein paar Tagen vor Gericht gehen müsste. Ich weiß, dass meine Mutter, während ich dort drin war, versuchte zu erklären, dass es alles ein Missverständnis gewesen sei. Sie durfte mich einmal vor dem Gerichtstermin besuchen. Im Gericht erfuhr ich, dass der alte Mann nicht gestorben war und dass er in einem stabilen Zustand war. Das war eine Erleichterung. Allerdings würden wir alle Arztrechnungen bezahlen müssen. Der Richter entschied, dass ich versuchten Mord begangen hatte. Sie akzeptierten nicht, dass es sich um ein einfaches Missverständnis aus einem schiefgegangenen Streich handelte. Tage später wurde ich in eine sichere Jugendstrafanstalt verlegt und man sagte mir, dass ich dort ein Jahr lang bleiben müsse. Ich sah, wie alle meine Träume vor meinen Augen zerfielen. Mit einer Vorstrafe würde ich niemals ein Stipendium bekommen und meine Mutter könnte es sich nicht leisten, mich auf eine Kochschule zu schicken, nachdem sie alle Arztrechnungen des alten Mannes bezahlt hatte. Diese Jugendstrafanstalt war schlimmer als die letzte. Die Jungs da drinnen waren hart und sie saßen dort für sehr schwere Verbrechen ein, wie bewaffneten Raubüberfall, Waffenbesitz und sogar Mord. 
Ich glaube, ich passte überhaupt nicht hinein. Und innerhalb der ersten Tage wurde ich schrecklich behandelt. Ich geriet sogar in eine Schlägerei. Und das passierte folgendermaßen. Ich saß eines Morgens in der Cafeteria und aß ein furchtbares Frühstück. Es war Toast und wieder irgendeine breige Substanz. Ein Typ namens Hayden kam und setzte sich neben mich. »Hey, warum überlässt du mir nicht das Essen?« sagte er. »Du hast dein eigenes«, antwortete ich. Er fing an zu lachen und rief dann seinen Freund Brandon herbei. »Du glaubst also, du kannst zu uns sagen, was du willst?« »Wir haben hier das Sagen, weißt du?« sagte er, während er mein Tablett auf den Boden warf. Wir gerieten in einen riesigen Streit und während ich mit dem Gesicht auf den Boden gedrückt wurde, hörte und spürte ich, wie jemand die Jungs von mir schubste. Ich dachte, es wäre einer der Werte, aber es war keiner. Tatsächlich weiß ich nicht einmal, wo die Werte waren und warum sie nicht ein Auge auf uns geworfen haben. »Geht es dir gut?« hörte ich eine Stimme sagen und ich rollte mich auf den Rücken. Es war ein Typ namens Jose. Ich hatte schon ein paar Mal mit ihm gesprochen, aber wir waren keine Freunde. Ich weiß nicht, warum er beschloss, mich an diesem Tag zu retten, aber ich bin dankbar, dass er es tat. Wisst ihr, Jose war Teil einer der gefährlichsten Gangs in unserem Staat. Als er verhaftet wurde, legte sich niemand hier mit ihm an, weil sie Angst hatten. Alles, was Jose tun musste, war ein Telefonanruf, um das Leben von jemandem komplett auf den Kopf zu stellen. Nach diesem Tag nahm er mich sozusagen unter seine Fetische. Es waren noch zwei andere Mitglieder seiner Gang im selben Zentrum wie wir. Wir hielten zusammen und konnten uns gegenseitig beschützen. Es war ein hartes Jahr, aber sie haben es definitiv leichter gemacht. Jose und ich wurden zur gleichen Zeit entlassen. Ich war erleichtert, denn das bedeutete, dass ich wenigstens einen Freund da draußen haben würde. Auch wenn ich frei war, war das Leben schwierig. Ich konnte meinen Job im Restaurant nicht zurückbekommen und ich hatte meine Stipendiumsmöglichkeit verloren. Ich wollte nicht wieder zur Schule gehen, also habe ich versucht, einen Job zu finden, um zu Hause zu helfen. Meine Mutter ging es nicht besonders gut und sie konnte kaum die Rechnung und die Miete zahlen. Es gelang mir, einen Job als Regaleinräumer in einem kleinen Supermarkt zu finden. Aber ich verdiente nicht viel Geld. Dann, eines Tages nach der Arbeit, rief Jose mich an und fragte mich, ob ich etwas mit ihm unternehmen wolle. Ich stimme zu und suchte ihn in seiner Nachbarschaft auf. Er saß auf der Motorhaube eines Autos vor einem kleinen Haus. Es standen mindestens zehn Mitglieder seiner Gang herum. Hey, ist es so lange her? Wie ist es dir ergangen, Mann? Fragte er, während einen Stapel 100-Dollar-Scheine zählte. Wow, wo hast du das alles her? fragte ich. Naja, ich werde mir nicht so einen blöden Job wie du suchen. Mein Lebensstil bringt viel mehr ein. Ich muss nur aufpassen, dass ich nicht erwischt werde, lachte er. Er erklärte, dass sein Lebensstil zwar nicht der beste war, aber er ernährte seine Familie und schickte alle seine Geschwister zur Schule. Warum gibst du deinen Job nicht auf und kommst zu mir? Ich zeig dir, wie es läuft, sagte er. Hm, da bin ich mir nicht so sicher, antwortete ich. Du wirst in einer Woche über 1000 Dollar verdienen. Ich verspreche es, antwortete er. Ich beschloss, dass ich nichts zu verlieren hatte. Ich war es leid, ein trauriges, erbärmliches Leben zu führen. Ich dachte, dass ich vielleicht eine Zeit lang illegale Dinge tun und Geld sparen könnte, um eine Kochschule zu besuchen. Wenn ich dann einen ehrlichen Job hatte, könnte ich mein Bestes geben, um alles wieder gut zu machen, was ich falsch gemacht hatte. Okay, ich bin dabei, sagte ich. Seitdem wurde ich in Hoseys Gang eingeweiht. Mein erster Auftrag war es, mit zwei anderen Mitgliedern der Bande einen Lebensmittelladen auszurauben. Es war aufregend, weil wir alle Masken trugen und ich mich wie in einem Film fühlte. Da wurde mir klar, dass ich einen Nervenkitzel dabei empfand, solche Verbrechen zu begehen. Ich habe mein Bestes gegeben, um niemanden zu verletzen und es hat mir Spaß gemacht, danach das Geld zu zählen. Ich habe schon eine Menge Geld gespart und manchmal bin ich nicht so begeistert von dem Leben, das ich jetzt führe. Es ist unehrlich. Niemand beschließt jemals, dass er ein Krimineller werden will. Aber mein trauriges Leben hatte mich genau in diese Richtung geschickt. Ich kann nicht glauben, dass alles mit einem Telefonanruf begann. Ich hoffe, dass ich eines Tages in der Lage sein werde, damit aufzuhören. Und ich werde es all denen zurückgeben, die ich bestohlen habe. Ich hoffe nur, dass sie in der Lage sein werden, mir zu verzeihen. My parents were so rich and loved themselves so much that they even built a statue of themselves. We had everything money could buy and more. I had like a zillion toys and I even had my own theme park. But I was never interested in their splashy lifestyle. I've always had a curious mind. Like for example, I couldn't get my mind off what was behind that red door that mom and dad forbid me from opening. So sometimes I would just sit and look at it. Samantha, you must be the only child on this planet who sits and gazes at a door when you have a room filled with toys. Well, I was wondering if maybe I could look through the peeping hole just once. But you know the rules, Samantha. Please? Fine, just one peek. I'm counting till five. Okay, time's up. No matter how much my parents wanted me to be like the other kids, fun and playful, 
I couldn't help but question everything around me. Like, why are ants so tiny? Or why do we all have two legs and not five? Even my teachers didn't get me. Okay, class, let's spell because. Daddy eats cold apples under suey elephant. Uh, yes, Samantha. Why does Betty eat cold apples under an elephant? Oh, Samantha, you're the special one, aren't you? I didn't care how people looked at me because I knew I was meant for something great. And then one day when I was around 10, I discovered my passion after watching Mira, the <laughs> royal detective. I wanted to be just like her. My parents even got me my very own detective magnifying glass, but they instantly regretted it during one of their lavish parties. Instead of dressing up in a frilly dress, taking selfies like the other girls, I walked around with my detective costume and magnifying glass. And as I was searching for clues to unravel anything mysterious, my detective skills took me into Mr. Shaquille's bag. He worked with my parents. And oh boy, was I surprised to find out what he had inside. Excuse me, sir. What are you doing with this? You inquisitive little girl. What are you doing in my bag? And bring back my teddy. He acted like a little baby the way he hugged the teddy. It was hilarious. <laughs> and then mom and dad took my hand. That is enough, young lady. Are you trying to ruin our party? I was just playing my favorite game, dad. Give me that. <laughs> no more detective games for you, young lady. But mom, that's what I love doing. Enough. My parents locked me in my room for the rest of the party. I felt such a burning rage towards them. And what they didn't know is that I knew how to unlock my room door with my hairpin, something I've been practicing for when I become a real detective. I checked if the coast was clear and slid my way downstairs. And no, I was not going back to the party. Since my parents took away my magnifying glass, I was gonna go into the forbidden door. And once I unlocked the red door with my hairpin, I was shocked to find a tall shelf with lots of files. I was so disappointed. I was hoping to find a room full of candy or diamonds or something interesting since I was never allowed in here. And then suddenly, a photograph fell off from one of the files. And when I picked it up, it was a picture of a young girl who looked like she was my age. Why do my parents have a picture of a strange girl? While I was studying the picture, I heard footsteps. So I quickly closed the door and switched off the light, waiting for the person to go away. Ah, <sighs> that was close. I sat looking at the photo every day, almost wishing it could talk back to me and tell me who she was. All sorts of things went through my mind. Like, was she my sister? But then why would they hide her away? Was she a long lost cousin? It definitely couldn't be an old photo of mom since the girl had rare blue eyes. It was all useless. Unless I was brave enough to ask my parents, which I wasn't. I eventually forgot about the picture, and I stopped playing detective. It was all just a big fantasy. Years passed, and then I was in high school. And my friend Tanya and I were the only two without boyfriends. Because no hot guy wanted intelligent girls with bags heavy with books. Oh, if only. I know, but they will never go for us because we're too smart for them. I usually snapped out of drooling over hot guys, but my friend Tanya, well, she was so desperate for love that she even stalked the football captain on Facebook, pretending to be some hot supermodel. So, does the captain want to meet you in real life yet? No, oh, you know that can't happen. With my big teeth, small eyes, and pimply face, who would ever like me? Hey, remember what I always tell you. Love yourself first before anyone else can. You're such a wise person. Thank you. I had deep love for Tanya. We only met in high school, but it felt like we'd known each other for a lifetime. I usually took a bus home with Tanya after school, but this time around my parents were waiting for me because apparently they wanted to celebrate some business deal dad made. Our lives are going to be even more perfect now, but we already have so much. Money can never be enough, my dear Sammy. Once you get the taste of making your own money one day, you will want more and more. That sounded so absurd. And then when the waitress came to take our order, my parents froze. And so did I, because her eyes looked exactly like the girl from the picture I found years ago. You. Sorry? We, we actually should get going. But I didn't take- Samantha, come on, let's go. My parents pulled me with them, and the girl looked so confused, and so was I. What was that about? Nothing, dear. I just felt a little sick, that's all. You're lying. I'm not five years old anymore. You two freaked out when you saw that girl. Samantha, when we tell you it's nothing, it is nothing. Now please shush. I felt so upset with my parents. They were definitely hiding something, and I was ready to put on my detective cap again and get back into the secret room. The next morning, I pretended to be sick. Sammy, it's getting late. It's time for school. I don't feel so good. Can I please stay in bed today? But you don't have a temperature. Please, Mom. I think I have a stomach bug. Okay, I'll ask the maid to keep an eye on you. I waited for my parents to go to their oil company they spent most of their days at, and then I went downstairs to check if our maid was around. 
It was so strange, but I guess it was pure luck because I found the maid fast asleep on the sofa. Hmm. She must have had a late night. I ran downstairs to the red door, but froze when I saw the door slightly opened. And when I got closer, my heart pounded so hard when I saw the back of someone's blonde head. What the freaking chickens? Who, who are you? When he turned around, the air in my lungs choked. This guy was gorgeous, but what was he doing in our house? He could be like a model in a hot magazine or something. What are you doing here? I live here. You have five seconds to get out or else I'm calling the cops. No, wait. I was sitting here under investigation. You and your family were at a restaurant yesterday and acted strangely towards the waitress. Uh, how do you know that? That girl was robbed of all of her parents' assets after she lost them. And when she was two, she was left at an orphanage. The caregivers found out that her parents were actually millionaires and they left their only child all their fortunes. Okay, and how did that connect to us? All the girl's assets were embezzled from her family name and company. The only way she can find justice is if we help her find a memory card, which has all the encryptions to her assets. I still don't understand how all this connects to my family. Deep down, I was scared to admit that this strange guy was maybe right. My parents might be the fraudsters. Well, their reaction yesterday triggered the girl and she contacted the CIA, who have been working on this case for years. If you know anything, you have to let us know. I started sweating and I felt so anxious when he questioned me. And then he suddenly called me as I didn't realize I was about to faint. Hey, are you alright? Can we get out of here? I feel a little nauseous. When we were in my room, I had to do the right thing. I showed him the picture. I found this some years back, in the same room downstairs. It's the same girl from the restaurant. You know what this means, right? It's just a picture. Your parents might be the criminals. I broke down crying at the sound of the truth, and the handsome, strained guy in front of me comforted me. I won't let anything happen to you. My name is Jake, and this is my number. If you see a memory card that your parents are very frantic about, call me. Thank you, Jake. I'm Samantha, and I really don't want my parents to go to jail. I know, but this girl they stole from has been struggling for a very long time. You can use the front door. My maid is fast asleep. Oops, I forgot about that. I saw her in the kitchen and sprinkled some sleeping potion around her. She'll be up after an hour or so. With that, he jumped out my window and disappeared like some kind of Batman. After hearing everything that Jake said, I was never the same again. The thought of my parents being criminals scared me, but ending up in prison was even worse. What would happen to me? Samantha! Samantha! Huh? It's your turn to go up to the board. I was not myself, and there was no way I could go up and do any calculations on the board. My life was falling apart. Samantha, what's up with you? I looked at Tanya, and I wanted to tell her everything. But instead, I just started crying. <laughs> Talk to me. Everything at home is falling apart. I'm sorry. Do you want to talk about it? I was sent home early that day, and I pulled myself together and searched the entire secret room for the memory card, and found nothing but paperwork of different accounts, but none of it was in my parents' name. Our life was a lie, and the truth had to come out somehow. Later that night, my parents had Mr. Shaquille over for dinner, and he still carried his bag with his pink teddy everywhere with him. I usually like to annoy him by accidentally touching his bag every time he was around. Do you mind? <laughs> Are you still in love with your silly teddy bear? It's made out of cushion. It's not going to break. Samantha, watch your words. Mr. Shaquille is much older than you. I'm sorry, but I think it's funny that a man his age would love a pink teddy bear so much. Unless he has, like, treasure hidden in there. <laughs> My parents gazed at Mr. Shaquille, gulping like they were guilty about something. I think it's almost time for you to go to bed, Samantha. I didn't hesitate to follow Mom's orders, because I had to call Jake. Hi, I think I know where that memory card is. Great, I'll meet you at midnight, by your window. I was so anxious about seeing Jake again, and actually exposing my parents. When he finally appeared at my window, I felt all kinds of butterflies swimming in my stomach. I was so crushing on him. Okay, we have to be very careful that no one hears us. Yeah, I know that, but the memory card is not here. I think it's in Mr. Shaquille's teddy bear. I can take you to his house. No, I don't want you getting into any trouble. You are safer here. This has been my childhood dream. I'm coming with you. And besides, you need me to find the directions. Okay then, I guess you're the leader. Jake had his car parked outside, and I was so nervous about this mission, but a part of me knew this was exactly what I was meant to do. Wow, you really are like Batman. Your car even looks like the Batmobile. <laughs> you're funny, but also cute. My face turned so red when he said that. When we reached Mr. Shaquille's house, we had two problems. His bodyguards and his scary dogs who growled at the gate, so we hid in the bushes. 
There's no way we can get it with all that security. That's why I always carry an extra dose of my sleeping potion. <laughs> you are my age, right? Yep, I go to school too. My uncle helped me become an intern with the CIA. Cool, right? So cool. When I was a child, I used to pretend I was a detective. I was the same, so I guess I wasn't the only weird one. Dogs are barking. I think they know we're here. Don't worry, I got this. Jake went closer to the gate. He got the dogs to sniff his hand, and they immediately fell asleep. And then he climbed the tree, jumped onto the roof, and started sprinkling the potion on all the bodyguards. Wow, he is so amazing. As we entered Mr. Shaquille's room, the first thing I spotted was a freaking toilet pan next to his bedside. And when Jake saw it, we wanted to burst out laughing, but we held it in. I think I see the teddy bear. He's cuddling it. Great. It was nerve-wracking watching Jake pull the bear slowly out of Mr. Shaquille's hand, and then suddenly he sat up awake, but his eye mask was still on. Who's there? My heart pounded <gasps> so much, but then I remembered the potion dust Jake shared with me, and I sprinkled it on Mr. Shaquille, and he dozed off immediately. Well done, Detective Samantha. We left Mr. Shaquille's mansion, and later Jake parked at a quiet parking lot where we tore open the teddy and found the memory card. Bingo. What will happen now? I hand this over to my chief officer, and your parents and Mr. Sheikh Yell will unfortunately be arrested. Hey, don't worry. I told you I won't let anything happen to you. When I got back home, the police were already there. I ran inside to see my parents, and they were so mad at me. Mom? <laughs> Dad? Samantha, what did you do? We gave you everything! You ungrateful child! I'm sorry, but I didn't want to live a lie anymore. After the cops took my parents, the girl from the restaurant appeared. Hi, I'm Jessica. Jake told me that you helped him. Thank you so much. I was taken back when she hugged me, and then a part of me didn't feel so bad for exposing my parents because an innocent person finally got her justice. I'm sure you're going to move into the mansion. I'll just get my stuff. You don't have to leave. What? This is your mansion. I have experienced the pain of not having parents and a home. Life can really humble a person. I would never want to see a good person suffer. Thank you so much. Even though my parents were not present, I still had the chance to be with my friends and continue with school. You know what you should do? You should write a book. <laughs> Maybe I will. But what I'd like you to do is put on your real face on social media. Because there is nothing better than the real you. Tanya eventually took my advice and even ended up having a real date with her crush. Some of my dreams also came true. Jake got me an internship spot with the CIA. And I was so good at my job. I think the diamond is in the bottle the suspect always carries around. Well, Samantha, I think you might be right. But all of my dreams came true when... Would you like to go out with me? Hmm, it depends, Detective Jake. On? It depends on what you know about me so far. Well, I know you like Mira, the royal detective. And? I know you like me, too. You know me well. You... You are so cruel, Kiara. You know what? One day, something bad is going to happen to you, and no one will help you because the truth is, you're awful! Hi, my name is Kiara from Louisiana. Please like and subscribe. Mom passed away when I was born, so my multi-billionaire dad raised me alone, and he spoiled me with money. Everyone fawned over me, but I knew it was just because I was a billionaire's daughter. One girl, Rita, the girl you saw earlier, was especially annoying in her attempts to please me. She will follow me everywhere. Oh, you spilled juice on your sneakers. It's waterproof. Oh, sorry. People would say she was super nice, but I thought she was too fake and itched to be rid of her. So when I invited her to my 17th birthday party and was about to cut the cake, I stepped up to her and pulled off her wig. Look guys, Rita's hair is actually two inches long. All the kids in the neighborhood were there, including her crush, Derek. Her face went red and she uttered those words of doom to me. She stopped visiting and talking to me after that, but that was a score for me. While I pretended to be the happiest outside, at home, I was lonely. Dad wasn't always around and I didn't want to socialize with the maids, so I kept busy on social media. One afternoon, I read a viral tweet about a bank robbery that happened that day in Louisiana. The robbers were being sought by the police. I barely had time to think about it because my bedroom door burst open just then. Hey, honey. Dad! It had been over two weeks since my dad left for one of his business trips. He never told me what he did there, only that it was top secret and he couldn't take me with him. I just came to see your face. I'm going back right now. Is it safe? I heard some robbers. Sorry, my princess. I'll contact you. I noticed then that Dad looked really tense. 
What's going on, Dad? You're surrounded. Open this door right now. <gasps> Suddenly, the reflection of flashing sirens filled my room. I rushed to the window and looked out to see police cars parked in our driveway and many armed policemen heading to the door. I turned around to tell Dad what I saw, but he was racing out of the room. It was like a bad movie. The police caught my dad before he could escape and arrested him for years of cyber fraud and the recent bank robbery. All of our servants ran away. I was shocked to my bones. I couldn't believe Dad was a criminal. I stayed up all night in the house alone and in tears, wishing for the first time that I had a friend, even if it was just a weirdo like Rita. Oh, I missed her now. How was I going to face people? It was all over the news what my dad had been doing all along. To make things worse, the next day, two men from a security agency came and told me that they would be confiscating all of dad's possessions, including my car and our house. Where will I live? You will be leaving with me. I stared at the middle-aged woman who I hadn't noticed before behind the men. And you are? I'm your mom's older sister from Texas, Mary. Texas? The state of cowboys and farm animals? Ew! I broke out into a run. I refused to live with an aunt who I had never seen before. She looked so poor. Hey, come back here. I ran at breadneck speed until I got to Rita's house. Rita, please open up! What are you doing here? Rita, please forgive me. Please tell your parents to adopt me. My parents can't harbor the daughter of a criminal. Sorry to disappoint. I probably deserved what she said to me. But there was no way I was going back to the house with that woman waiting to take me to Texas of all places. I wandered aimlessly for an hour until I found myself at the park. Tired, I sat on the bench and soon dozed off. My mistake. Because when I opened my eyes again, I found myself in a small, dingy bedroom. Where? Where am I? The woman who called herself my aunt appeared at the doorway. You're finally awake. Welcome to Texas. What? I was at the park in Louisiana last time I remembered. She told me they had searched for me and found me asleep on a bench there. Because of her work, she had to return to Texas today, so with the help of those security agents, I was bundled into her car, and to their surprise, I remained asleep all the way there. Take me back right now! Yara, you should be grateful for this opportunity to change scenery. She was right. If Rita could act that way towards me, what would the rest of the kids in the neighborhood do? Everyone would be making fun of me. Can I get something to eat? Sure. Soon, she served me a tray of food that I couldn't make out what it was. What is this? White bean soup. This is a meal for peasants. Half bread is better than none. Left with no choice, I ate the meal, but vowed to order something more befitting in the morning. But in the morning, when I tried to order breakfast from a nearby breakfast delivery, I found out that the credit card dad gave me had been blocked. How could I live in poverty? For days, I stayed holed up in my tiny room. Aunt Mary would go back to work and come back to find me in the same position. Sometimes, I rejected her peasant food. Your food has gone cold. The food is beneath me. If it's so bad, why don't you find work to do so you can earn money to afford your favorite meals? I wasn't born to work. I knew I gave her a really tough time, but I was so mad at how my world had turned upside down, I couldn't see anything else. Until one stormy night. Ah! I hate storms! Aunt Mary! I came across her sleeping on the floor in the living room. Hey, why are you on the floor? Go to your bedroom. You're sleeping in it. That's... that's your bedroom. You left it for me? I hadn't bothered to explore the house, so I had no idea it was the only bedroom here. But why would she do that? She had nothing to gain from me. You're sleeping on the floor here for me to sleep on the bed? Why did you bring me here when you're not even comfortable? You're my precious niece. Would you prefer I left you to be taken to a foster home? Tears filled my eyes. All along I had been a brat to her when she had actually done me a favor by showing up. I doubted I would have survived in a foster home. I vowed to be a better niece to Aunt Mary from then on and help her out. So the next day, I went with her to meet Mr. and Mrs. Smith, the couple she worked for in their mansion and apply for a part-time job. Ma'am, sir, I would also love to work here part-time. Great, we are in need of another hand in the kitchen. Thank God it was not the farm. <laughs> the wages they proposed to pay was nothing like what my dad gave me on a weekly basis, but at least I was earning it legally. On my first day of work, I dressed in one of the few designer clothes Aunt Mary had packed for me. 
As I made my way to the mansion, I passed a plainly dressed girl who had her back to me and was shoveling mud from an empty ranch into a wheelbarrow like a pro. The next second, I felt something wet and sticky land on my back. Mud! It was mud on my Dior shirt! You! Are you blind? Do you know how much this shirt cost? She turned around to face me, and I almost lost my footing. She was so beautiful. Bright green eyes, dark hair with bangs, a leanly built figure, and even though she was quite tall, I could tell she and I would be around the same age. Sorry, princess. I don't have eyes at the back of my head. But when she spoke, my awestruck state shattered and I regained my temper. Oh, you dare to insult me after what you did? Hey, stop barking. Who wears a Dior shirt to work anyway? She even had the gulls to look amused. You, you witch! I rushed toward the ranch to grab some mud and throw it right back at her top. But when I looked in her eyes again, I just couldn't do it. Thank your stars, I can't bear to touch mud. Ooh, scary. Ah! She was infuriating! After my event with the silly girl, I cleaned the kitchen and went on to do my last task for the day, serve the Smith's dinner. On getting to the dining room, I froze when I saw who sat at the dining table with Mr. and Mrs. Smith. The mud girl! She had cleaned up all the dirt and wore fresh clothes, but there was no mistaking her. She gave me a huge smirk when our eyes met. Oh, Kiara, have you met our daughter Mia? Come closer and say hi. Don't be shy. Yes, Kiara, come say hi. Hi, Mia. Panicking inwardly, I quickly set the table and served their food, afraid she was going to spill everything about how I had spoken to her and get me fired. But all she did was bore holes into the side of my head with her piercing green eyes until I left. Gosh, did she not know it was rude to stare? Later, when I came to clean up the dining table, Mrs. Smith sat alone with a smile on her face to announce that Mia had chosen me to be her help. That's not a problem, right? No, ma'am. Inside, I boiled with anger. The spoiled brat wanted me to be her personal maid so she could torture me. Good. So go upstairs and let her tell you what she expects of you. I climbed the stairs to her room like it was haunted. Hello? Her room was much bigger and well-decorated than mine back at the mansion. I was a girl of her class, shoveling mud. Is this some kind of joke? Turning me into your personal slave? Correction, assistant. That's just... She stood up from the chair she was sitting on, and I felt the words dry in my throat as she leaned over me. Call it anything you want. I intend to double your pay in two weeks if you are good. But if this cranky attitude is what I have to put up with, then please leave. Of course I couldn't leave. And from the triumphant smirk on her pretty face, she knew this too. What do you want me to do for you? And can you give me some space? Does being this close bother you? Why should I? You just smell a lot like dirty mud. It was a lie, but I wasn't going to let her win. Your task is to do whatever I ask of you. First, you'll stand there and sing until I fall asleep. Only then can you leave. Could this get any crazier? Seeing as I had no choice, I began to sing a song that could hopefully give her nightmares. Soon, I was hearing soft snores, and when I snuck a peek at her, she was sound asleep, looking like an angel. A beautiful angel of evil. Later, I couldn't sleep when I thought of all the humiliating things she would tell me to do. What if she treated me the way I had treated Rita? It came to me then that I had been very wrong with what I had done to Rita. If I could be scared of being treated the same way, it means I had dished Rita a meal I couldn't take. And her words then, it really looked like it had come to pass now. After a moment, I typed an apology to Rita. The other one didn't count. I had just been desperate to escape my aunt. Now, I felt truly sorry and sincerely hoped she forgave me. I prepared for work the next day with my stomach in knots. Yara, don't be so scared. Mia is a very good girl. She treats every servant with respect. Well, maybe every servant but me. Our front door was pushed open, and there, dazzling in the morning sun, was Mia. Howdy, Kiara. You're late. Morning, Miss Mary. And so my life as Mia's personal maid began. Odd thing was, she hardly gave me anything serious to do. She cleaned up after herself and made her bed and would instead assign odd and sometimes very embarrassing tasks. It looked like she hired me just for her entertainment. Pick out my underwear for tomorrow. Brush my hair while I read. Once, she even asked me to do something that made me blush to the tips of my ears. Feed you? Yes. I am sure you have hands. They are scabbed over from shoveling manure today. 
I forgot to wear gloves. Why do you even work on the farm when you have servants at your disposal? I get paid. Won't your parents give you money even if you don't work? They will, but I am happier to work for it than receive handouts. At least when I share it with the less privileged, it doesn't feel like I'm throwing away money that isn't mine in the first place. Wait, you work, get paid, then share it with the less privileged? What? It's called giving to charity. Wow. Despite the fact she was utterly annoying, my respect for her climbed very high that evening. She was a much better person than I had been when I was in her position. She even treated the maids like they were friends. I managed to feed her a few spoons when I noticed that our faces were really close. It was as if she was going to kiss me. I need to go. Kiara! I did my best to avoid Mia after that day. I needed to sort out all the confusing feelings she was making me feel. Thankfully, she didn't bother me either. I focused on helping Aunt Mary out on the farm. One day, I was throwing feed into the fish pond when I heard a growl behind me. It was a bull of monstrous size pawing the ground. It looked like it was about to charge at me. Help! Kiara! Out of nowhere, Mia appeared with a red cloth and began to wave it at the bull, distracting it from me. Back off, boy. Soon, other servants rushed in and helped to rein the bull. My heart was still beating when Mia approached me. Kiara, are you okay? Something about the gentle way she spoke to me and the concern in her eyes pulled me in like a magnet. And before I could register what I was doing, I pressed my lips to hers. Uh, is this thanks for saving your life? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know when I- Are you saying you regret it? Cause I don't. You don't? Mm-hmm. I liked you from the very first day you yelled at me. So, is this why you took an unpermitted leave from me? I was getting too hot for you to handle? I have never felt this way before. You really like me? In response, she pressed her lips to mine again, and I took that as a yes. Aunt Mary came rushing toward us then with a phone in hand. I don't know if she had seen us kiss or even knew I had almost been attacked by a bull, but she looked really anxious. Yara, there's someone on the line for you. Who? Your... your mom. My mom? Oh, isn't she dead? Hello, my name is Skye, and I'm from New York. Please like and subscribe to find out how my 15th birthday wish ruined my life. When I was five, I woke up to find my mother kneeling by my bed. A voodoo doll was on my chest, and mom had her hands over the doll, chanting some strange words. I screamed and sat up from my bed. What are you doing, mommy? Sit still, child, otherwise the magic won't work. The voodoo doll was creeping me out, so I grabbed it and threw it across the room. Mom gasped and raised her hand as if to slap me. You foolish girl, why did you do that? Now we'll never be able to fix your ugly face. What do you mean you're scaring me, mommy? I was trying to take away that ugliness and put it in the doll. The fortune teller said it worked. Do you know how much I paid for it? Now it's ruined and you're going to be ugly forever. With that, she picked up the doll and left the room, slamming the door behind her. I cried and couldn't sleep all night thinking about how scary mom was acting. I grew up convinced that mom hated me because she never missed a chance to pick on me and remind me how ugly I was. I had crooked teeth and got braces as soon as I joined high school. My vision was terrible, so I had to wear thick glasses that covered half my face. One time, when I was in second grade, my Aunt Patty and my baby cousin Nessa came to visit. At night, I was woken up by Nessa crying uncontrollably. I went to her room to check and found her all alone. I called out for Aunt Patty, but she didn't respond. I picked up Nessa to comfort her, but I stepped on one of her toys, tripped, and fell on my back with baby Nessa. She wasn't hurt, but she started crying even louder in panic. Just then, mom walked in and picked her up. What's wrong with you, Ska? Are you trying to kill your cousin because she's prettier than you? It's not like that. I tried to pick her up and then I fell. That's a lie. I saw you trying to hurt her. Get out of my sight now. But mom... I said, now. I bolted out the door and bumped into Auntie at the door. I hugged her tightly, crying. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Aunt Patty. I didn't mean to drop Nessa. Please believe me. Hey, calm down, sweetheart. Tell me what happened. 
I tried to explain, but mom interrupted, saying that I was lying and that I was really trying to kill Nessa. Aunt Patty wiped my tears and comforted me as mom sneered at us and kept warning Aunt Patty not to trust me. My mom was the worst, you guys. As you can imagine, I wasn't very popular at school. I only had two friends, Ken and Maggie. We had been friends since middle school and were inseparable. Lately, I'd started to notice Ken stealing glances, and whenever I caught him staring, he'd blush and stammer. It was so obvious he was crushing on me. Ken was really cute, but I had my eyes on Brandon, the hottest boy in our class. Brandon only ever talked to me when he wanted me to do his homework, and I did do it for a while until Ken convinced me not to anymore. I decided that Ken was right. I'd had enough of Brandon using me, so guess what I did? One day, I waited for him to hand me his math homework, and I threw his book so high in the air, it hit the ceiling. Hey, what did you do that for? I'm tired of being your servant. You can do your own homework from now on. You're gonna regret this. You're lucky I even let you touch my books. He collected his books and stormed out of class. Little did I know, I was going to regret what I'd just done. Every day, after spending the whole day ogling Brandon, I'd go home and write in my secret diary about all the fantasies I had about him. I wrote page after page of made-up scenes of Brandon being my knight in shining armor, Brandon kissing me in front of the entire school, Brandon and I wearing matching outfits. Okay, that last one was a little cringy, even for me. I felt very pathetic, pining over a boy who'd never be mine. A boy who I'd just yelled at, actually. So you can imagine my surprise when, at my 15th birthday party, Brandon and his friends showed up. I was so nervous. I must have ran to the bathroom more than 10 times trying to fix my face. I was gathering courage to talk to him when Maggie walked out of the kitchen carrying my birthday cake. Blow the candles and make a wish, bestie! I was so excited to make my wish, but as soon as I blew the candles, someone pushed my face into the cake and everyone started laughing and taking photos and recording videos. I looked ghastly with cake all over my already messy hair and giant ugly glasses. Oh my god, I didn't know it was possible for her to get even uglier. What a freak. All the kids laughed even louder. Embarrassed, I ran to my bedroom and locked myself in the bathroom. Ken followed me and stood outside my bathroom door, begging me to come out. He sat on my bed waiting, but he finally gave up and left. After a while, I came out to get my diary and read it because it always made me feel better, but it wasn't where I'd left it. I frantically looked for it and was about to go into full panic mode when I saw it behind the door. How did it even get there? The only other person who'd been in my room was Ken, but he'd never touch my diary. If someone read my diary, I'd never show my face at school ever again. I put the diary in the drawer and slumped on my bed and fell asleep. That's right, I fell asleep at my own birthday party. Also, I should have opened my diary, but I didn't. And that's how I walked into a nightmare at school the following day. As soon as I walked into class, everyone looked up. Was this about my face and my birthday cake? I thought they'd have forgotten about that by now. I was about to take my seat when Brandon stood in my way, a few papers in his hands. I told you, I'm not doing your homework anymore. Instead of answering me, he started to read one of the papers out loud. Brandon was wearing a really tight shirt today. He looked so hot, I thought I was gonna melt. As he went on half laughing and half reading, I came to a horrible realization. The papers he was holding were from my diary. I tried to grab them from him, but he held them higher and continued to read. On my 15th birthday, I wish to kiss Brandon just once. His voice was high pitched. I guess he was trying to sound like me. That was my birthday wish, and now Brandon was reading it out loud in front of the whole class. Give it back, Brandon, please! Do you know how ugly you are? And do you think I'd actually waste my time with someone like you? Everyone burst out laughing. 
honestly, Sky, I'd only ever kiss you if you paid me. And even then, I'd have to be blindfolded so I don't have to look at your ugly face. Just then, Ken stood up and punched him hard in the face and a fight broke out. I got caught in the middle of it and my glasses fell off. I went down on all fours to look for them, but Brandon stepped on them, crushing them into tiny pieces. Boy, did I regret ever making that birthday wish. I finally managed to slip out of there and Ken followed me. Sky, wait! No, leave me alone, Ken. You have to listen to me. I know it was you who leaked my diary, Ken. You're the only one who was in my room. No, I didn't. Don't lie. You always say that I'm wasting my time liking Brandon. I guess you were right. You won. Now stay away from me. And with that, I ran out of there not giving him a chance to talk. I didn't show up in school for the next couple of days and instead, I went to visit Aunt Patty. While there, I told her everything that had happened and as always, she had a solution. Let's give you a makeover, shall we? I couldn't contain my excitement. Aunt Patty owned a salon and I always envied her clients. She always made them look so pretty and fancy. We spent the next few days working on my new look. And let me tell you guys, forget about mom's voodoo doll. Aunt Patty was a magician. She turned me from a pumpkin into Cinderella. She applied a lot of stuff to my hair and gave me a haircut. Next, she threw away my hideous glasses and bought me contacts which, I must admit, were uncomfortable, but I was ready to do just about anything to look pretty. Finally, she took me to have my three-year-old braces removed. She even bought me a whole new wardrobe. When I finally went to school, I looked so different that nobody recognized me. The moment Brandon saw me, he took my hand and introduced himself. Oh, let me show you around, new girl. My name is Brandon. Brandon, it's... Me, Sky. Was I about to reveal my identity to Brandon and have him reject me again? No way. So, I cleared my throat and lied to him. Skylar. My name is Skylar. It's lovely to meet you, Princess Skylar. Please, walk with me. Did you hear that? Brandon just called me a princess. For the next couple of weeks, I had all of Brandon's attention. I was having so much fun, I completely forgot about Ken and Maggie. One day in class, Brandon leaned over to kiss me. I was nervous and happy at the same time. My 15th birthday wish was about to come true. I closed my eyes and waited, but instead of warm lips, a very cold hand landed on my mouth, shoving me backwards. I opened my eyes ready to pounce, but stopped when I saw Ken standing there. Did he recognize me? I panicked and shoved him right back. What's wrong with you? How can you seriously be interested in Brandon after everything he put you through? I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, come on. I know it's you, Sky. Just because you got a makeover doesn't mean you're a different person. You're still the same girl Brandon treated like trash a few weeks ago. The whole class gasped. My name is Skylar. I don't know who Sky is. You can fool everyone else, but you can't fool me. Why did you change yourself? There was no point in lying anymore. I was ugly and no one liked me. You're wrong. I like you and I still do. You were never ugly to me. I waited for you to like me back, but you were so busy trying to get Brandon's attention. Ken walked towards me, but then Maggie grabbed me and pulled me away from Ken. Maggie? What's going on? I can't take this anymore. You don't deserve Ken. I like him, but all he cares about is you. We listened in shock as Maggie confessed that she was the one who leaked my diary pages because she was jealous and wanted to humiliate me. And just when I thought she was done talking, she said something even more shocking. When you came back all glammed up, I made a deal with Brandon. I paid him to distract you. I turned to Brandon. You knew it was me this whole time? Don't look at me like that. You came back looking smoking hot. Also, how could I say no to money? 
You're disgusting. Oh, please, don't pretend like you didn't enjoy it. I couldn't believe how arrogant Brandon was. What did I ever see in him? I took Ken's hand, but Brandon grabbed me and pulled me to him. Where are you going, princess? We're not done yet. Are you seriously choosing this lame guy over me? I pushed him away and looked him dead in the eye. I'm still the ugly sky that you humiliated weeks ago. Come on now, princess. You could never be that ugly chick. You know I don't hang around those kinds of people. Now come closer and let me grant you your birthday wish. He tried to kiss me, but I slapped him hard and stamped on his foot. Stay far away from me. I took Ken's hand again and we walked out of class. I had no idea where we were going, but I was too happy to care.